Half a day and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Half a day, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If we can uh, begin this oversight hearing on the Guam Contractors License Board, scheduled for Wednesday, August 2nd, 2017, it is 10 a.m. in the morning. And for purposes of the open uh, door policy or open government law, the initial notification on this oversight hearing was disseminated on the 25th of July and the second notice was disseminated on July 31st to all of the stakeholders as well as to our media partners in the community. I'd like to uh, once again uh, thank our media partners for continuing to not only work with the legislative body but work with the committee in disseminating this information on the oversight hearing. I do have a couple of individuals that have signed in, but ladies and gentlemen, we're going to initiate this oversight hearing with the members of the Guam Contractors License Board. So if I can invite Mr. Adonis up front and any of the members of the board who are presently here. And before we begin the discussion, I'd like to recognize Speaker Cruz. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for joining us this morning, and also the Vice Chair of the Committee, Senator Tommy Morrison. Thank you, Senator for joining us this morning. The order of the agenda for the information of the public is the oversight on the Guam Contractors License Board. First item is the review of the application process. The second item is the review of complaints and appeals process. The third item is the number of applications submitted to the agency for each of the past five years. Fourth item will be the number of applications approved or denied for each of the past five years. And that would have a sub-discussion on the discussions on reason for denied applications. And then finally, uh, I will open it up to any known irregularities uh, or activities that have taken place with regards to the agency that either myself or members of the committee or the legislative body would like to uh, inquire with the members of the Guam Contractors License Board. So, Mr. Adonis, if I can ask you to please identify yourself for the record and proceed with those particular items. I understand that you have a testimony that you would like to read into the record. Good morning, uh, Senators, uh, Speakers, Senator Agun and Senator Morrison. Happy day. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we're, we're so we're, we're glad that uh, we'll be here, uh, senators, to uh, to answer some question about it. And uh, and yes, uh, we'll 100 percent. I like to clarify everything and for the good of uh, our our island, you know. So so uh, as per uh, agenda A, B, C, and D. We sent this, uh, these uh, letters uh, to the legislature yesterday, so we can we can start uh, working on that on the uh, on the on your agenda. And uh, uh, which one you want me to start it, Mr. Adonis? If I can ask you to just have the other individuals on the table identify themselves, and then you can proceed. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And, uh, Please, you can turn it on. Yes. Half a day buenas. My name is Marion Pizarro. I'm the chairman for the Guam, Li Guam Contractors License Board. Good morning. Good morning, Senators. My name is uh, Robert Thompson. I'm the uh, alternate board member for the Department of Revenue and Taxation. Good morning. I'm Ad Vice Chairman Adelia Custudio. And we do have another member of the committee that has joined us, Senator Rodriguez. Thank you very much, Senator, for joining us this morning. Uh, Mr. Adonis, I did share with you the sequence of the questioning, line of questioning. And the first one is the review of the application process. And the purpose for this is to ensure that not only the committee members, but also uh, the general public understands exactly what the application process is. And then we'll go into some line of questions, please. You may proceed.
Okay, uh, senators. This is a review of the application process. Applicant submit application from prescribed by the board. This is the document required. Certification of not less than three person in support of the uh, applicant's experience must have add, uh, at least 10 years immediately preceding filing application, not less than four years as per man, supervising employee or contractor in the particular contracting field, the applicant intends to become a contractor. The board in its discretion may approve certain technical training or business administration, training as acceptable experience, but not in case Will such training count as more than one year experience? Certification of not less than two persons who can attest the applicant bears in good reputation for honesty, truthfulness, and fairs and fairs dealings. Proof of financial solvency, bank letter of credit attesting to financial solvency or financial statement from the bank, a list of projects completed within the last four years. So th that's the, uh, the application process, Mr. Senator. And the approving authority? Uh, Mr. Adonis, the approving authority is the board. Is that correct? Yes. Not the executive director, but the board. Okay. Did you want to continue with your presentation, your written presentation? I know you have it, the investigation section highlighted, and you have the review of complaints and appeals process as part of your written testimony. Did you want to go ahead and proceed with that, or? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Senator. Okay. After that, it will go to the investigation section. Investigator conducts investigation on the applicant interview. One of the applicant passes the interview, the investigator returns the file to the administration division to schedule the written examination. Examinations are given every second and fourth Tuesday of the month. The applicant pays the applicant fees for the treasurer of Guam. Action for application, the board has 40 days, 45 days, I mean, sorry, filing a proper application for license and payment of the fees required to hack on every application. Failure to pass the examination, the applicant who, who fails the attain of passing grade may be given a re-examination within 90 days without necessity of reapplication additional fee. Attached is a copy of the application. We, we have attached here, uh, Senator, form as, the, as prescribed by the board. The CLB, Contractor License Board application process is well structured and runs smoothly. Mr. Adonis, you may, you may continue. Continue. Okay. With the sub item B. Thank you. Okay, on the B, review of complainants and appeals process. I'd like to inform you that since 2013, the CLB has not been regularly assigned a assistant uh, attorney general. Recently, I have worked with assistant AG Thomas Killer to assist us on the CLB legal issues. Complaint process. Consumer can file their complaints at our office by filing out the consumer complaint, complaint form. We have a form that is attached on our submittal there, Senator. Complain, complaints are forwarded to the investigation section and logged in the logbook and assign a case number. An investigator is then assigned to the case, number one. Investiga 
investigator review the case and if additional documents or information are needed, will call the, com the complainant to submit. Investigators sent notice to appear to the contractor to give them an opportunity to, to respond. Some cases could be resolved if the complainant and the contractor are willing to come into settlement. Some cases and others contracts, money disputes are outside of our jurisdiction. In case the board advised the parties to settle in court as, as appropriate, upon completion of their investigation, the investigator will give me a report with recommendation. I review the complaint and the investigator report and forward the complaint to the board to consider at its next meeting to review new business for the new business. The CLB board determines if a complaint is proper and what action to take. If the board determines that the violation has occurred, a citation is issued. There's attachment there, uh, Senator, that we attach it which is, was revised within the past year. The citation placed a contractor on notice of the HALEG violation and proposed and proposed action. If the contractor dispute the allegation as he has 15 days to clarify the contractor license board of such and request a hearing. Contested disputed cases goes to the CLB, CLB board for a hearing. In every case where it is proposed to, co to refuse to grant a license or revoke or suspend a license or refuse to renew a license, the board gives the person concerned notice of hearing in conformity with the administrative adjudic adjudication law. We go on appeals. An applicant who has been refused a license and every license whose license has been suspended, revoked, or not renewed may appeal to the contractor license board, decision to superior court, in the manner provided in administrative adjudication law. Number of applications submitted to the agency for each of the FAS five years as per your agenda, Senator. The CLB received 5,120 5, applications for the past five years. This is including the uh, renewal and the provisional license. 2012, 1,075. 2013, 9, 997. 2014, 997. 2015, 1,011. 2016, 1,040. Number of application approved or denied for each of the past five years, 2012 to 2016. The CLB had total of 5,120 approved applications. Approved news, this is including renewal, 2012, 83, 2013, 74. 2014, 73, 2015, 82, 2016, 88. Renewal for 2012, 951. 2013, 893. 2014, 882. 2015, 885. 2016, 898, and then we have a provisional license, 2012-14, 41, I mean, I'm sorry, 2013-30, 2014-31, 2015-31, 2016-32, 2017-33, 2018-34, 2019-35, 2020-36, 2021-36, 2022-37, 2023-38, 2024-39, 2025-36, 2026
2016-54. The six applications were denied in the past five years was submitted by the investigation supervisor denied the application stay with the investigation supervisor and it does not give it back to the administration section despite them asking for it and return. But uh, the supervisor investigation came in on Monday uh, early in the morning, so it was submitted. And discussion on reason for denied application, the main reason for the denial of the application is if the applicant lacks of necessary experience for the classification that they are, they are applying for. <clears throat> Once the applicant translator passes the interview, the investigator returns the file to the administration division to schedule the written examination. Examination we are given uh, every second and fourth uh, Tuesday of the month. The applicant pays the applicable fees to the treasurer of GOM. Action on application. The board has 45 days after filing a proper application for license and payment of fees required to hack on every application. Failure to pass the examination, an applicant who fails to attain a passing grade may be given a re-examination within 90 days without necessity of reapplication or additional fee. Attach is copy of the application form as prescribed by the board the CLB application process is well structured and runs smoothly. A review of the complaints and appeals process. I'd like to inform you that, Senator, that since 2013, we don't have been regularly assigned a assistant attorney general on our office. I have worked with the AG as of now, uh, Assistant Attorney General Thomas Keller to assist us on the CLB legal issue. Issues. Complainant, complaint process. Consumer can file their complaint at our office by filing out the consumer complaint from our office. It's attached, that we have submitted, attached as a copy. Complaints are forwarded to the investigation section and log on the logbook and assign a case number. An investigator is then assigned to the case. Investigator review the case and if additional document or information are needed, will call the complainant to submit. Investigators send notice to appear to the contractor to give them an opportunity to respond some cases could be resolved if complainant and the contractor are willing to come into settlement. Some cases, contracts, money disputes are outside of our jurisdiction. In, case, in cases of this board advise the parties to settle in court as appropriate. Upon completion of their investigation, the investigator will give me a report with recommendation. I review the complaint and the investigator report and forwarded the complaint to the board to consider at its next meeting new business. The CLB board determines if complaint is proper and what action to take. If the board determines that the violation has Cured in a citation is issue, it, it is there attached is a copy of the citation, which was revised within the past year. So the citation placed a contractor on notice of alleged violation <clears throat> action. If the contractor dispute 
the allegation he has 15 days to notify the contractor license board of such and request a hearing. Contest and dispute cases goes to the CLB, Contractor License Board, for a hearing. In every case where it is proposed to refuse a grant or license or, or to revoke or suspend a license or refuse to renew a license, the board gives the person concerned notice of hearing in conformity with the administrative adjud adjudication law. A fails. An applicant who has been refused a license and every license whose license has been suspended, revoked, or not renewed may appeal the contractor license board decision to the Superior Court or manner to provide administrative action. Okay, number of applications submitted. Oh, I read this already. So. Yes, you did. So that's it, no? Okay, Mr. Adonis, uh, thank, thank you very you. much for your testimony. Just so that we can uh, understand the process clearly, in this particular case, the application process requires that documents be submitted yes, and certified by the applicant that all the information is, is true. Yes, Certification of not less than three persons is necessary to support that application, mm -hmm. and that an application, applicant not, shall have not less than four years' experience in certain areas, yes, either sir. as a foreman, supervising employee, or contractor in a particular contracting yes, arena. Another requirement of the application process is certification of not less than two persons who can attest that the applicant bears a good reputation for honesty, truthfulness, and fair dealings. Another requirement is proof of financial solvency, mm -hmm. which would require a bank letter of credit attesting to the financial solvency or financial statement from the bank. And then finally, as part of the application process, is a list of projects completed within the previous immediate four, four years. Now, when the Contractors License Board receives the application packet, and it has all this information. It is referred to the investigation section automatically? Yes. yes. The entire packet is referred to the investigation section. And then the investigator conducts a thorough investigation to verify all of the information. Mm -hmm. And then works on administering the test. Testing. Yeah. There's an initial interview process where yeah. all the information is verified and then if that applicant successfully completes that initial interview process, then that applicant is given an opportunity to take the test. Yes, sir. Correct? Yes, sir. And the te examinations are provided every second and fourth Tuesday of every month. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, transitioning into the complaint process. So if, in fact, a complaint is filed, the complaint is referred to an investigator or to the investigation section? Uh, it, it will go first to the uh, investigator. You know, he has, we have a form uh, complaint on the, uh, on, on the front, so they will get that and then they will file a complaint and then after we receive that complaint, we stamp and log, log it on our, then we give it to the investigator. And then the investigator obviously investigates, reviews yes. all of the information, yes. verifies uh, the validity of the complaint, yes, sir. and then provides a report with a recommendation to the executive director or to the board. Yes, that's true. To to, uh, to, uh, yes, to recommend first to me, and then after that, I will, I will give it to the board. Yes. Okay, and then based on that, the board has to act within a certain time frame. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Yes, sir. On any complaint yes, sir. that is filed, what's that time frame? What, what that's for? When the investigation section completes the entire investigation and provides a recommendation to the executive director and to the board, okay. how long is that time frame where the board has to entertain that complaint? Uh, well, we'll review the complaint 
and the investigator, rep the investigator report, and then uh, we forward to the board at its next meeting with the new business so that the board they can make uh, their uh, recommendation. But you do provide the complainant with uh, a timeline to be notified? Yes, sir. Right? Or yes. the, uh, the contractor that's, that a complaint has been filed on as yeah. well as the individual that filed the complaint? So yeah, what mostly, is mostly they will compl the contractor will complain first, you know, and then we'll investigate it. We'll work on it on what they are complaining. Just. So when the board entertains, I guess in this case, Ms. Pizarro, when the board entertains a complaint, you, you require that, in fact, the contractor as well as the individual filing the complaint both be present at that meeting? Not necessarily. Please, if you can turn on the mic. Not necessarily. What only is presented for the board for any decisions is what the board enacts. Okay, then is there a required time frame to notify the contractor or the individual that files the complaint that it will be entertained at a subsequent board meeting? Is a time frame is subject to the facts and any information that's going on between the contractor and the complaint and any parties in between. We have recommended encouraged timelines, but however, uh, that is just um, at the discretion of the parties at hand. So you don't have a 15-day requirement or a 14-day requirement that the individual that is receiving a complaint or the contractor where the complaint is being filed, that they have to be notified at least 15 days out from a contractor's license board meeting so that they can have ample time to be able to be present and make accommodations and also the individual filing the complaint? There's no required timeline? Yeah, yeah, it's a request, yeah. Okay. Yes, sir, yeah. We have, we have, we have to, to give a, a, a time timeline on that to, to work on that complaint. So what's, what's the required timeline for notification? Uh, well, uh, on, because on the obviously the open government law requires that uh, notices of meetings as well as the agenda be provided within one week time frame. But my question is directly towards the contractor license board. Is there a required timeline to notify any contractor or any individual in which a complaint has been filed and it's been investigated and will be considered by the board? What I can do is um, I'm going to open this discussion to someone who has also served as the executive director of the contractor's license board and he's also the vice chair of this committee. So, so he can provide some additional information. Senator Morrison. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Director Adonis, uh, Chairwoman Saru, and uh, uh, members, staff of uh, COB. Um, I, with respect to, uh, specific to your, your question, Mr. Chair, I, I think, you know, reviewing these cases, some cases, uh, uh, as it was by the chair, I mean, by Director Adonis, mm -hmm. um, some of these, um, understand depending on the not only the caseload and the and also the uh, the, the type of investigation uh, what um, uh, the contractor or individuals being um, cited for you know um, the timeline period really uh, begins uh, I mean initiates there but specifically to a a, a threshold of 14 or 15 days, I mean, that's, you know, uh, particularly on, on the, the investigation, on, on the uh, investigator supervisor also to try to move these cases along. Yeah. And, uh, you know, normally, you know, some of them are extensive that require the help of the attorney general's office. So, you know, having that time frame. But as far as notices, uh, once the investigators are prepared uh, to provide uh, those facts or those findings to the board, the investigation, or me, our investigator, investigator normally would be present with, and, and notices will be provided to the uh, complainant or to the and to the contractor uh, that these cases will be heard before the board. So I, I, I hope that answers uh, your question, Mr. Chair. I, I think if you're asking for like a threshold of when a case is filed, uh, it depends. I mean. I mean, some cases come in automatically. I mean, if it's, 
an unlicensed contractor, sometimes that happens within a day or five days. Contract these uh, issues can get addressed where the unlicensed contractors, it's clearly obvious that the individual is unlicensed, but you know, some cases requiring consumer complaints with workmanship, uh, type of classification, you know, uh, those kind of are more extensive and require more time. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Morrison. I think you, also Senator. in addition to the comments that have been shared by Senator Morrison, my, my issue is not uh, the timeline for the investigation section to do their job. It's beca because we anticipate that they will do a thorough and extensive work in validating any concerns or issues that are raised by someone filing a complaint. And before they present anything to yourself, Director Adonis, or to the board members for consideration, they have to make sure that it's complete and comprehensive that it, and that it presents factual information. So that's why, with, with regards to the investigation section, that's a component that I'm sure that they do due diligence in carrying out their responsibility. My question is, is more or less with regards to upon the completion and upon forwarding the, complaint, the findings and recommendation to Director Adonis and to how long does it take before it's considered by the board and your response is that it most likely would be considered at the next board meeting and then now in terms of due process and notification, I'm trying to backtrack. If they're going to be entertained at the next board meeting, how much time yeah, is provided for the contractor as well as the individual that has filed that complaint to be able to make accommodations so that they can work their schedule and ensure that they're present at that meeting when that complaint is reviewed and considered by the board. So that's where really where the line of question comes in in terms of how much time is actually provided. And what I'm hearing is that it's added to the next docket for the next board meeting and not necessarily meeting a 15-day timeline so that the individual and the contractor can have due process. So that's, that's a, a, an issue that, uh, Madam Chair of the board, that I encourage you to, to look at because we certainly want to make sure that any individual or contractor that receives a complaint filed against them, that they have every opportunity to not only review the documents, review the complaints, but also find out what the recommendations are and have that opportunity to be present at the board meeting and, and any subsequent hearing that may be necessary. Now, let me ask you, um, you just mentioned, Director Adonis, about the Contractors License Board receiving complaints. And from what I'm hearing from you is that if a complaint is filed, it is referred to the investigation section. The investigation section will carry out their responsibilities, do their research, provide a recommendation back to, to yourself as the executive director, and then you decide when it's going to be placed in the next board meeting. I received information where, in fact, a complaint was filed in 2009. Perhaps this is not doing your time, so please make sure you qualify it. I'm just I'm referring again to the process because if there's a process in place, we need to assure all of the applicants and the contractors who submit an application that this is the process. This is the timeline. If there are any concerns or any complaints, these are the additional timelines that have to be considered. Now, if the board or the, the director exceeds those timelines, then they have every right to come back and question the process in terms of fairness and ensuring that it applies to every single applicant and every single contractor that comes in and puts in their, their application for a license. So there was a situation where an, a complaint was filed in 2009 and was not considered by the board until 2015. When it was considered by the board, the individual that filed the complaint was not satisfied with the response by the board. And this individual felt that the board dismissed the, the, the content of the complaint and then refiled a complaint and has attended every board meeting, refiled a complaint in February, I believe, of last year or earlier this year and has attended every board meeting and has yet to have that complaint entertained. And that's why this whole process is being reviewed 
to look at some of these issues that have surfaced. Um, it's, I know that the media had covered several issues. Uh, one was a license being given to a non-US uh, unauthorized individual. Can, can I ask you to please explain that only because it came out in the media and then it's also a concern that was raised as a complaint? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Senator, uh, I think I have to give this call the uh, admin on that. That's, uh, that's their uh, ad, ad, on the administration. Okay? I'm sorry, Madam Chair? Would that be okay for the administration section to answer your, your Absolutely. question? Absolutely. Please okay. identify yourself for the record. Yes. Good morning. My name is Maria Perez. I'm the administrative uh, officer for Contractors License Board, and I'm in charge of licensing. Um, there was a corporation. Uh, the individual like we explained, uh, went through the process of the interview and then went before the board uh, for the review of the application. Myself, Mr. Zapanta, the investigator supervisor, Mr. Donis, revenue and taxation, and the board members agreed because what we don't just sign it, we review everything. And that certain corporation was approved. On regards to the ID card, there was an ID card that was issued to an individual and the ID card did not say that he was a, that he took the, uh, he took the exam and it, d it didn't say that he had classifications like general building, general engineering, or anything. It was issued by, uh, we give, you, give ID cards to individual who, who uh, does business transactions. So the ID card stated for business transactions if they're going to do any banking or anything like that. Um, one of my staff members, you know, we made a mistake. We admit to it. We were later on found out about it. it our office, uh, the investigator, uh, Nita Bailey. Ms. Ferris, can I, can I ask you to provide at least a semblance of a timeline? Uh, in terms of you recognize the mistake and then how long it took you to either rectify it or your final action on that mistake or does that contractor still presently have a license? No, the individual does not have the um, ID card. Within three days we were able to retrieve the ID card and the ID card did state for business transactions only. And it was retrieved. So the license? It's an ID card. Okay, so the license was retracted? Yes, sir. On that contract? Uh, yes, the ID card, yes. Okay, now let me ask uh, another question with regards to red flagging contractors or licensees. Yes. Because there was a situation not too long ago where a list was disseminated to all of your personnel, Director Adonis, uh, highlighting certain contractors and red flagging them that they are not to receive a contractor's license. There was a situation in which that listing was posted for about 30 plus days and then one of the contractors on that list received a license after 30 days. So can I ask what's the, what's, what was the purpose of overriding your decision to red flag these individual contractors who had done business in the past and for whatever reason were placed on a red flag list not to be given or considered licenses 
And I would think that any time that you red flag a contractor, that that red flag would stand for a minimum time frame of six months, a year, or plus. But then within 30 days, one of those contractors on that list received a license. Can you explain, please? And I, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with that situation. Can I? Yes, Senator, uh, this is on the uh, admin section. Uh, I, I, I can't explain really 100% uh, on that. Uh, I will repair it to Maria, the, the admin officer. Thank you. On regards to um, red flagging an individual, our office usually requests that we speak to the person that took the test, which is the responsible management employee, and they come into the office and they, they talk to the investigation or um, because from my understanding, we're not allowed to deny a contractor uh, to renew a license unless we follow the Administrative Adjudication Act. I'm sorry, uh, <clears throat> I understand that, Ms. Paris, but the law allows you or Mr. Adonis and the board to rescind any license when, in fact, any of these contractors meet certain conditions identified in the law. So it's not a question of, of administrative adjudication action. It's providing the contract to due process, but if they break the law, you automatically, that very moment, can rescind that license, but provide the contractor with due process of recognizing what the offense was, what the illegal activity was, and then give them that hearing that opportunity for an appeal. That's where you, on behalf of the interests of the business community and on behalf of the interests of the people of Guam, you have that responsibility. Provide a, an appeal process so that that contractor, that individual would have due process of being able to provide information or to question anything that is being thrown in their direction as it applies to breaking the law. But please know that as stewards of the people of Guam, the law is on your side. Yes. So, so and, and to make that statement that you are not allowed to rescind any application or any license without allow, allowing the licensee to go through an administrative adjudication process, that is absolutely incorrect. And, and I encourage you to seek the guidance of your legal counsel from the Attorney General's office so that that representative will continue to guide you as the law provides because we do not as a community condone any illegal activity only because of the administrative adjudication process. You have a responsibility to rescind that license immediately, stop that business transaction or that, that contractor from conducting business and then allow that contractor to go through the due process in terms of being able to, to provide responses to the claim. Yes. But, but be, being mindful that you have an investigative arm in the contractor's license board, that only reinforces that opportunity to validate that that contractor is breaking the law. So please know that the law is on your side, but you have to follow the law. Yes, sir. And in order for us, in order for, um, our section before we do any before anything I do I always verify with my director I don't just uh, do it on my own let me ask uh, let me throw out another situation please director Adonis and I'd like to and this is in regards to the administration of the examination and apparently there was an individual who had uh, approached the contracted license board, had undergone the initial interview process 
preview process and had failed that part of the process and was notified. So that individual was not given an opportunity to take an examination test. Okay, understanding the process, you, you allow them to go through the initial interview, they successfully complete that, then they take the examination. But because this individual did not complete, successfully complete the interview, they were not given an opportunity to take the exam. That individual returns two years later to the Guam Contractors License Board and without going through the interview process, took the examination. Can I ask why and how that took place? Let me work on that, Senator, and then I'll, uh, I will, uh, I will return. I will give you a, a letters about that. Uh, I don't recall that as of now, but I'm, I'm going to work on that. But Director Adonis, I'm giving you an opportunity to explain. Did that situation occur? Well, there's some, uh, it's up and last. Uh, Mr. Adonis, it's a yes or no. Did that situation occur? No, unless they're going to submit a, a complete... Uh, Mr. Adonis, did that situation that I just highlighted occur? I'm giving another opportunity. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. That's correct. Then. The story is correct? Yes. Okay, so how did you correct it after the fact? Well, uh, I'm going to correct on that. Uh, from now on, uh, since about uh, three months ago, we're, we're working on that, uh, Senators, about uh, especially our uh, uh, law and uh, the capability of those people that they are applying some contract contractor. So we're, I'm going to, I'm going uh, kind of steep now to be uh, the applicants supposed to be uh, uh, capable to what is applying for. Thank you. So what have you done to reinforce the process, Mr. Adonis? Well, uh, because if you're saying, and, and I'm just asking you, just understanding the process, I'm just asking you, okay, you're saying now you're being more stringent, but what have you done to notify your team members or the people working in the Guam Contractors License Board entity that this is now the new policy moving forward? What have you done since recognizing that that took place? Well, uh, yes, Senator, I, 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 I made a, a meeting about uh, four months ago, three months ago, something like that. So uh, on, that, on those kind of mistake, I don't want to be happen. From now on, everything will be go on by law. Thank you. You're saying from now on, everything is going to go by the law? Yes, sir. Mr. Director Adonis, yes, sir. like I said, the law is on your side yes. Yes, as sir. long as you're following it. Yes, Senator. But I'm not telling uh, the public that there's something what's going on before. So uh, since I came there on, as a director, so I uh, have there uh, Senator Morrison. So we, we, we're doing some improvement there. And, uh, and like I said, there, uh, by next month, uh, there's a two kind of engineers from the United from the States and the Philippines to to give us some uh, new testing and uh, some improvement for for our territory. You know, so. it's, it's Thank you, Director Adonis. Uh, Madam Chair, do you have any statements you want to make on this entire discussion? What are we? No. Chairperson Pizarro. No, not at this time. I'm just listening and just gathering more information. I think Maria would like to comment on it, if that would be okay, Mr. Chairman. I'm addressing the question to you, oh, Madam Chair, because I just heard that there's a break in the process. The scenario and you just described is uh, something new that I Madam just Chair, first heard. Be mindful, please. That's not the only scenario. Oh, I see. And if you've read the paper, in the last couple of days, 
There are other situations that call the immediate attention of the board members. Not, the, not only Director Ordonez, but the immediate attention of the board members to address these concerns because we want to ensure that any applicant, any contractor understands what the requirements are for the application. Absolutely. You meet all those requirements. Yes. Guess what? You're going to go through the investigation process. You will be given a, a license after you pass the examination. But Correct. in this case, I just shared a couple of stories, situations where, in fact, it appears to me that some rules, I'm not going to go to the extent of laws, Correct. may not have been followed. I see. So, I, Madam Chair, yes. I'm going to say this again, and I'll say this for one last time. The law is on your side, but you have to follow the law. Absolutely. And I say that ex explicitly because of some of the concerns that have been forwarded to the Attorney General's office. And if there's any validity from a, an outside entity, the Office of the Attorney General, on some of the situations, he's going to come right back to this very table right here. Yes. And be mindful that if any member of the board Director Adonis or any member of the Contractors License Board does not comply with the law, you no longer have the protection of the government. I'm making just a general statement. So Mr. Adonis, I think you have a, some work you need to do in getting this process refined because there are some complaints about the process, about the fairness about individuals who have lied in their application, but the application information was taken on its face value, considered perhaps not by a couple of the board members here, but were considered by the board and approved. And then a complaint was filed that some of the information provided in the application was untrue. And then the complaint was filed, and to date, the complaint hasn't been entertained. So that is an automatic reason to decertify or to take that license back from that contractor if the information provided in the initial application is untrue. And I'm talking about information that can be validated, such as finances, which is one of the requirements. That's why, Director Adonis, I asked you to highlight the process highlight the requirements, and one of the requirements is good financial standing. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to go back to the uh, statement that was made by the administrative officer and Mr. Adonis pointing out the uh, um, the reissuance of a license and the, and, um, and was when the license was red flagged or this applicant or contractor was red flagged, did the investigation unit um, advise the admin to uh, uh, to place this license on a uh, at least on a provisional until such time their investigation is done regarding whatever findings they have? Or was it a reissuance of a new license with no provisional? I'm not sure which, um, <clears throat> which license they were talking about, but uh, example on some applications where um, they stated that they didn't they took the test, they passed two years later, they didn't come back in. What I, I would do is I would sub get the application, give it back to Mr. Adonis, and I will say, okay, he was interviewed two years ago, but the test scores are no longer good. Can he fill out the three qualification, the two character reference, and all the updated information? and in the past, like we had former investigators, they said, yeah, it's okay because I interviewed him. So that, that's how we went about it is we verified with the investigator and uh, they said it's okay. 
uh, we get all the updated I'm sorry, information. Can I interject? Senator Morrison, yes, an investigator interviewed that individual two years prior, but that individual failed the first interview. So by two years later, by submitting a whole new application, because they failed the first interview, don't you think that individual should go to a second interview? And then proceed with the process? Yes, if they did fail, then they should go In through this scenario, second. that individual failed the interview. Okay. So two years later, you forewent, you did disregarded the interview process and just went ahead and administered the examination? No, what we do is if they have an issue or anything, I always give it to uh, my director. I, I understand, Ms. Paris. You went and you spoke to the director. Can we go ahead and allow this individual to fill out the application? But it doesn't mean you forego or disregard the interview process because that individual failed the first interview, so you disregard that completely. It's a whole new application. You have to go through the interview process. It's either that or the process that was just highlighted a little earlier is out the door. And that's where the fairness and equity applies. Every single applicant that comes in, they want to know that they're going to be treated fairly. If there's an issue about their finances, an issue about their credibility, an issue about not getting uh, necessary endorsements by others, then they're not meeting the application requirements. But if they meet all those application requirements, they have to go through the interview process, they pass that, they take the examination, someone else comes in, just because they took the examination the, or the interview process two years prior, failed it, they don't have to go through the interview process again? No, we... No, from, that's the scenario that happened in that yeah. situation. Please, okay. Ms. Paris, don't try to change it. I'm sorry, Mr. Vice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> you know, uh, Mr. Adonis, I mean, you brought up earlier the process. I understand that process very well, and the clear, uh, you know, the checks and balances of the uh, investigation unit and the, the administration. And is there a clear separation of these two divisions when it comes to I mean, checks and balances of these applications coming through or a, the reissuance of a license renewals or of those licenses that are going or co applicants, contractors that are going on a, um, on a, um, uh, on an in inactive status. Is the investigation reviewing that portion of it? Because I want to make sure there's a clear separation of, of of, you, you, you talked about the process, I understand that process very well, and we rely heavily on the investigation section to, to really vet, uh, especially through, through renewing um, and knowing that even you know, these contractors may, contractors may have some complaints against them, against them, but even through a reissuance, the investigation would flag uh, this contractor and, and notify uh, this is where admin comes in or the, the yourself to place this individual or contractor on a provisional license for amount of 30 60 days to, to notify our people that this contractor has uh, a, a pending issue that is being addressed and that's the reason why the provisional is there that's why I was asking that earlier that um, I'm trying to understand if there's a clear separation of the process here and ensure that the investigation uh, recommendations are adhered to. <clears throat> are, is there a clear separation? Um, so you can tell this body here that there is. A uh, thank you, Senator Morrison. Actually, as of now, it's on the AG office, that one. So to, uh, I submit that about uh, two weeks ago, you know, about the provisional license and things. So uh, they might call me about uh, next week on that one, according to the AG office. Yes, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I checked that to the, to the, so that it will come up only one one instead of two, two parts, you know, so, so uh, it's on the AG office on that case, uh, Senator, we'll notify you about that. <clears throat> Mr.
Mr. Mr. Adonis, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that you know we have the investigation section here, mm -hmm. and we have admin here. I'm just want to make sure that that you know the people at least know that we're trying to get some clarification here. That you know what 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 I'm sensing here, or um, is that there's even though we have a checks and balance process within yes. the contractors licensing board, it seems like there is a a, a commingling or of, of duties and responsibilities and that there there's a clear line where the investigation as as stated earlier by the chair that um, the investigation uh, flagged the co uh, applicant or a contractor therefore you know immediately immediately you should notify admin yourself that you know um, that this contractor should go on a provisional license to such time they address their concerns with the, the board um, I'm hoping there is really a clear separation of, of uh, responsibilities. Yeah, Senator. Uh, yeah, when I uh, when I check that uh, provisional license and self construction, it's a, it's a, there's a big difference on that. So that's the one I consult to the AG. So we will find out by next week on that. Thank you. You know, um, what was reported in, in the media was a, a, uh, re, a issuance of a license. I know the, the chair brought up so, something similar, but of a license issued to someone that uh, didn't meet their criteria uh, outlined by yourself, uh, outline, um, clearly what the process is. Um, did this um, individual or contractor um, provide a RME I mean, or is it this contractor? Because it seems like this contractor was, or this applicant was, um, what it seems in the paper, it was a process that was bypassed. But I know the, the other process, maybe that needs to be clarified, was this uh, applicant uh, applying through an RME, Responsible Management Employee. If you read the article in the post, I mean, referring to a uh, um, an applicant that was issued a license, and um, by, by sort of meaning that they were bypassing a process that we talked about earlier, and I'm just wondering, some of these ca contractors, as applicants come in, and, and it seems like a fast track process, but they're coming in ap applying through a responsible management employee. That what was spelled out in the, the article was this applicant applying th through a RME. Because if he wasn't applying through an RME, then that applicant had to go through the whole through process of the interview. And once interview is uh, cleared by investigation, the investigation will forward it uh, to, if it was approved, to the director and an admin would uh, proceed with the testing of the contractor's law and whatever classification they're applying for. I'm just trying to make sure, because that what was reported, it seems that that this individual was able to bypass that process if he wasn't applying through an RME. Okay, there's two issues that was put on the on the media. One, it stated that um, it bypassed the process, but what happened was. Uh, one of the staff members in the office was currently off island. So the director requested an uh, investigator to do the interview. They went through the interview process. Uh, he got approved. He took the test. He passed it. 
it was signed off. Then when the corporation documents came in, uh, everything was attached. And when we reviewed it, the document I signed off on, on it, uh, someone was saying they got bypassed, uh, they didn't review it or anything, but we have documentations that I signed it, the investigator supervisor signed it, Mr. Donis signed it, uh, revenue and tax, and one of the board members signed it. So it wasn't bypassed. He, this individual already reviewed the packet and that's one of the things that's on the media. Then there's another issue where um, a contractor came in, he tried to get, an, uh, re to get his license um, in order for us to uh, document. Uh, I s asked my secretary if she can write an email to the investigation section and saying this application is with you, we need a response, we need to do something within 45 days. A uh, month later came, we sent another request, no response. The contractor came back into our office and said, I really need my license. I said, I'm sorry, I don't have your documentations. He goes, can I give you a copy of what you submitted? So we said, okay, so we got the application, got all the necessary clearances, the individual that didn't sign off of it was off island. So the director reviewed it and signed on his behalf. That's another issue. But the original application is still, uh, we, I never received it. But we do have a second copy, and then the license was issued. Then they were stating that our office, uh, the individual said he was coming in, example, uh, maybe November, December. Uh, it was already typed up. He didn't come into the office until January and he made the payment. So people are saying that we gave him a free license and then he can pay it later on, but that was not true. I also have documentations from another uh, contractor. He came in, gave us his documents, he's disabled, and he turned in his documents in May. We typed out the license in May. He didn't come in until June, later part of June and then he made the payment. Our office does not give the licenses to the, to the individual. We just waited for him to come in and that's why the receipt is different from the license date. But we do not release any licenses until the payment is made. Those are two of the do, do, those are two of the items that was in the media, and then there's another issue where um, the board members. I don't know if you we already spoke about it. Where we had two contractors. Uh, one contractor was saying that um, he was owed money by two of the contractors, but our board reviewed it and our board already agreed it's a civil litigation. So we explained that to him. This is a civil case. When you get your outcome from the courts, you are allowed to come back to our office 
and then we can settle it. But once you're in the courts, we don't do anything. And then a few years later, he comes in again and he tries to file the same complaint. But um, our board chairman says, didn't we hear this already? And I said, yes, we heard it. So we said, it was already discussed in the past board meeting and we already explained that this is a civil matter. So, it's not that we weren't following the law. Sometimes people are not satisfied with our outcome. So, they try and come in and file the same complaint. But our board members stood their ground and said, it's a civil case. Even the documentations that were there, they were from off-island. Thank you. I, I just want to also, you know, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, th recently the uh, Public Law 3310 requires publication of all licensed contractors uh, uh, annually. And, you know, based on that listing that was published, is that safe to say to our community that those contractors have gone through the uh, the process either through renewing or new uh, that those contractors have gone through uh, the process of the contractors licensing board and clearly vetted and and safe to work with yes mr. chair I'll maybe come back okay thank you very much senator Morrison senator Lee Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I did want to give the panel an opportunity to um, address many of the concerns that were raised by my colleagues, that have been raised by the public. Um, so this is kind of a general question. I, I wanted to ask, um, I understand you have the authority. The, you have the authority to issue these licenses. And with that authority also comes great responsibility. And the burden really is on your shoulders to, um, I guess, express or demonstrate to the public. Um, so I just wanted to give you all, maybe we can start with uh, Mr. Ordonis, Ordonis if, um, I guess my question is, what can you say to the people of Guam that can kind of demonstrate your integrity in this process, that can demonstrate how, I know we've kind of discussed how you vet um, some of the contractors who come to you, fill out the applications for their licenses, there have been a lot of issues raised, but what can you say to, to uphold the public trust and to just people who are questioning your ability to lead and your ability to, to do your job. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to, I guess, express or demonstrate the integrity of your office. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Well, uh, mostly I, when they come on our office, I, uh, I entertain them. Uh, Entertain good with the, you know, I say half a day and welcome to contractor license board. So then they're going to say, uh, sir, we are applying some, uh, we're applying for contractor license. So, so you're, I told them you're very welcome. So on that one, and then we gave them a, uh, the, our format, the form that they're, and uh, I told them it's good, it's good for the, Guam that that you you decide to have a business and uh, our island will be improved and uh, you know uh, and uh, I told them uh, so I asked first if the, what what is their their experience those are the, the number one and they said like that like this and then I told them so go ahead and peel up your uh, this application and like I said you're very welcome to have a license 
to help the community and you know the highland so but make sure that you have the experience on what you are applying yeah, so that's all i'm telling them uh, senator about it Perhaps the, the board chairwoman could, could assist um, in responding to this question, but it's, it's my understanding that so many members of our community who currently have contractor's licenses, who have been issued contractor's licenses in the past, so many people want to be able to follow the rules. They want a level playing field. And I think that's what we're really trying to get to the heart of the matter here is um, it's great to be welcomed and it's great to have the application presented to them, but what can you tell us, what can you tell the committee and the community that's going to help us to feel better about this situation and to, to really feel like you're taking all the steps needed, you're really vetting, you're making sure that these people who are applying have the qualifications, have the certifications to be issued these licenses. Well, uh, we, <coughs> we, have a, we have a form that they have to, to follow uh, all the requirement uh, to, to get their license. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, classification on that, uh, on that license. Not the, the A is for, uh, for uh, only for horizontal, like civil work. It's B. It's for structural. When you have a B uh, license, you can build a, like a hotel, you know, so high rise. And there's, a, there's some uh, classification that they can get it like electrical, master plumber, and, and, so, and so many, and so many things that they can, if they cannot afford to get those like general contractor, we can help them on the uh, like light, light, light uh, business, like okay. uh, maintenance, something like Thank that. Thank you, Mr. Donis. Perhaps the board chairwoman could expand on that or, or attempt to answer my question. And maybe even Ms. Paris, if you'd like to just jump in whenever yeah. she's completed. Thank you, Senator. Mm -hmm. Just with everything that's been discussed, I believe for myself and the other board members, we, we honor the law and we take the rules and regulations very seriously and all the procedures that are set forth for the agency to follow. And, and as much we, we adhere to it. And if there's um, items that might come to light, we, we correct it, we try, to, we try to address it, and we try to work with the team so that, uh, so that we are honoring and serving the people of Guam. And that is very important to myself and to the board. So what can you say to, I mean, I'm not sure if you've fully answered the question that was um, posed by the chairman and, and by other of my colleagues, but there have been certain members of our community who have come back to the Contractors License Board for years and have still not had their issues resolved. So it's my understanding that there were instances where you've found that um, a mistake has been made and you've tried to correct that right away and you know within days we've had a resolution to that but there have been other times where that hasn't been the case and so it's very frustrating to members of the public when they feel like their issues aren't being addressed their concerns aren't being addressed in a timely manner they can't continue with their business and like Mr. Adonis said and mentioned this affects our economy negatively it affects all the people in our community so what can you say to those people who have had years of of concerns that have been constantly raised, they've been attending these board meetings and they haven't had their concerns addressed? Well, one for sure, we want to make sure any ongoing investigation, that the reports are complete and final and truthful. So any decisions that's made by the board, we want to make sure that everything is complete and true. Um, and so we just, we take those reports, we take those recommendations from every single agency from the departments and we we take the recommendations and we consider what would be the best decision based on the laws and so if there's frustrations or misunderstandings we at best we try to uh, communicate the um, the decisions that are made um, whether they're at the agency level or at a board level 
we try our best to just let them know we're just following the rules and the laws. Ms. Paris? Our office is basically, we try to arbitrate between the consumer and the contractor. We try to mediate to see how can we resolve our issues. Um, we just spoke with one of the individuals who's assisting us with the examinations with their office. And he was stating that anyone now who's trying to take the test is required to purchase the study guide because even if you take the test and pass, they still, you cannot use the excuse that I didn't know the law. So that's one of the issues that we're trying to, to resolve. And many times if we have, uh, just not so long ago, we had an individual who had a complaint for over, trying to build her house for over three, four years. And uh, I would say maybe it's 95% uh, finish, but she's gotten, if she, they don't feel that nothing is being done, um, my director will uh, try and give it to someone else to see if they can take care of that case and just instead of just sitting with one individual. So um, the homeowner did request to uh, give it to someone else and there was a, a tremendous difference when it was changed. And uh, as a matter of fact, she was supposed to be here today, but she is, uh, I believe her husband is sick. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Lee. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I move forward with questions, I was wondering if you would be so kind um, if Mr. Eduardo Zaponta is here. Director Adonis, would you mind if we invite uh, your chief investigator up front? The reason why I ask this, Mr. Chair, is because there's a very relevant testimony to a matter of what is being discussed today. So it's very germane to the operations and uh, what's the center operating procedures that you have within the Guam, Guam Contracting Licensing Board. Is Mr. Zapanta here, Director Adonis? Uh, talking, you're talking about... Uh, Mr. Adonis, uh, as a chair, I'm going to request the uh, presence of Mr. Zapantis, oh. okay, so that he can respond yeah, to good, the good yeah. senator. Yes. Mr. Zapantis, please, yeah. if you can join us up front. Um, before she asks the question, if you can identify yourself for the record, and then the good senator, Nelson, will oh. be asking you some questions. Good morning, Your Honor, uh, Senator Hagan, Senator Morrison, Senator Lee, and Senator Nelson. My name is uh, Eduardo O. Zapanta, Investigation Supervisor of Contractor Licensing Board. Thank you, Mr. Zapanta. Uh, Senator, if you can just indulge me. Uh, just one question, Director Adonis. Is Mr. Zapanta on government time or on personal leave? Is Mr. Zapanta on government time or is he on personal leave? It's on government time, sir. He's on government time at the moment. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Zabantas, you recognize that? You are on government time, so whatever questions are posed by uh, the good senator or myself, then we will yes, request your cooperation. Yes, Thank Your you. Honor. Thank you, Director Adonis. Thank you, Mr. Zapanta. Do you have a prepared testimony for, for this oversight hearing? Um, Yes, uh, I do, uh, but uh, I was supposed to um, make copies yesterday at our office uh, when our administrative officer tried to uh, stop me from making copies at uh, our office. 
Okay, I have in front of me um, a May 19, 2017 letter from, to Elizabeth, Bar Elizabeth Barrett Anderson from the Attorney General from Edward Ozaponta, CLB Investigation Supervisor. Is that you? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Senator. Uh, you raised a bunch of concerns in this letter. Uh, and I'd like for you to read out these concerns. So if I could give him this copy of the letter and then he can read from it. Yes, Your Honor. Someone from our staff? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is, my, yes, please. Thank you. <clears throat> this is addressed to uh, Elizabeth Barrett Anderson, Attorney General. Uh, subject is about uh, case number 2017-02-04, Tomas V. Tanaka Jr., or known as HSG Company Limited, versus Vicente J. Carmona. Uh, known as KPL Guam Company Limited. Dear Honorable Attorney General, I humbly would like to get an opinion from your office since you represent our agency as our legal counsel. I would like to forward the following documents regarding the above mentioned case which I already forwarded to our board members last May, May 10, 2017. It has been seven working days and since then I have not received any feedback from neither one of the board members or executive director, Mr. Eduardo Ordonez, likewise. Never made any communication with me after he refused to reassign the said case to me. This case involves two issues. First is about the complainant's concern and second is an internal issue about the contractor license board staff. As the investigation supervisor of the COB, I tried to give courtesy to our director to properly address the said complaint, but it seems that Mr. Ordonez looks like he chose to make me stay away from the case. Maybe there must be a reason why this case was totally mishandled and was kept totally concealed from my knowledge. Mr. Ordonez and investigator Nida Bailey failed to follow our office standard protocol because they knowingly bypassed the system which is supposed to be brought up to my attention before, before they even decide not to take action and just close the case and state that no violations were found. I do not understand how would a serious case with a multiple violation such as case number 2017-02-04 be closed just because the respondent returned the contractor license ID to our office that was illegally issued by our admin staff. Right now, I don't, I don't really know what uh, is my next move because my position title as a contractor license investigator supervisor was not properly addressed according to the golden rule which is the proper chain of command that both my boss and subordinate were mistreating me and I find it very unjustly. If Mr. Ardonius authorized me to take over the case I would have conducted the reinvestigation and properly addressed the case according to our laws, rules, and regulations. Though our director and investigator disrespected my position, I still offered my assistance to resolve the case according to the administrative adjud adjudication law in which the complainant was requesting that the issues be brought before the board. On the other hand, our internal issues are something that has to be addressed by the proper authorities because, because it is a very serious matter 
that has to be investigated. The main purpose of the contract, <coughs> excuse me, the main purpose of the contractor's license board and its laws is, is mainly to protect the safety of the public, which I feel that which I feel that some of my co-workers failed to abide by its purpose. Your Honor, I humbly ask your assistance regarding this sensitive matter about our agency's multiple irregularities that our own staff has been violating its own laws, rules, and regulation, the fact that we must enforce it according to our mandate. Thank you, respectfully. Thank you, Mr. Zaponta. After uh, sending this letter to the Attorney General's office, did you receive a response? Uh, as of present time, I haven't received any response from the AG. Okay. And you stated that you, this case was reassigned to another investigator. Is this correct? It was assigned uh, while I was off island. Okay. And you brought up concerns about the, the case? Yes. Mr. Adonis, what was your reason for uh, this reassignment. Actually, actually, the uh, case, uh, Mr. Supantas. I'm sorry. Can I hear you? Can you please speak the into the microphone? Actually, the case, is, Mr. Supanta is is really the one who's, uh, in charge on that case, and then it was transferred to the other investigator, and. Uh, and then uh, he wants to he wants to to get it back. In fact, uh, the, the, he, he, he made the letters that he wa he wants me to sign right away to to get that case. And then I told him no because who the made a letter? The, the investigator that is doing that. What case, is the name of the investigator? Uh, Nida Bailey. I'm sorry. Nida Bailey. Okay. Uh, that's, She's the one who's holding uh, that uh, Ted Nelson case, okay? And then, then he's rushing me to, he, he made a letters to, I have to sign it right away. And then I told him, I have to talk to my, this is a very serious problem and I need to talk to my boss. I got a boss, uh, the governor first before I sign everything. So, then that's, that's Mr. The Ardon yeah. Ardonis, you are the executive director? Yes. And what happened when you spoke with your boss? And Who's then, your boss? Okay, yeah, that, the, the, my boss said, oh, it's good that you don't have to sign right away her letters that you, there's, not, uh, there's not really review by that, uh, by that time, you know. So I didn't, I didn't sign that, uh, that letters to, and then after that, I... Uh, I wrote a letters to the AG that he used my letterhead without my knowledge. He should talk to me first before he wrote a letters to the AG. He, he, he cannot write a letters without my permission to the AG. So why, what did you, if your boss told you to not sign it right away, what did you do then? Which one? For the investigation you discussed, what did you do then? Well, uh, we just let it go. Uh, it, it took it took the pile the piles uh, piles from other investigator without. What do you mean? You just let it go? He's the one who's holding now that that the, those piles. He took those pilings, you know, about those cases. Okay. So he, then he is working on those cases now. Okay. And the reason why I'm asking specific questions about cases because also we have testimony here from a Mr. Park, and I know that he's not the only um, concerned uh, member or concerned constituent about the dealings of the Guam Contracting Licensing Board. Mm -hmm. And a matter of fact, some of these date back to 2010, 2011 that have yet to be resolved. What is the reasoning for not resolving these issues, especially after many letters were written to the Guam Contracting Licensing Board? Well, this case, uh, Senator, is, uh, it was dismissed twice by the board. And, uh, Why was it dismissed? Yeah, uh, uh, the board dismissed that because it's, uh, that, that's too long, you know, how many years already. And, uh, uh, so you're telling me the board dismissed the case because 
It's, what do you mean by too long? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, as of now, it's, uh, I think it's on the civil matter. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can you talk to us? I believe that was the case that was previously discussed by Maria. It was already um, recommended and encouraged that it was a civil, it was a civil matter, and it was outside our jurisdiction. For all the way up to 2017, in regards to Mr. Park's testimony. Yes, Mr. Zapanta. I would like to. Uh comment on this case since I'm the invest, uh, investigator assigned to this case. Uh, actually, this case uh, was brought up 2009 and uh, mm -hmm. during uh, that time, it was uh, rejected by the board because of uh, statute of limitation. But then again, uh, Mr. Park uh, approached the AG and uh, verified if uh, the statute of limitation applies to the contractor's licensing board. So Monty May made uh, an opinion and he advised that there is no uh, statute limitation on uh, the contractor license board that applies. So the board accepted the, the complaint when Mr. Park came back uh, with that uh, opinion from uh, the Attorney General's office. So um, it went on like uh, for about more than two years until the board finally found out and uh, agreed that there was a debt owed by Suk B. Choi or known as uh, Kyo Myung Corporation to Mr. Myung K Park, known as PIC Inc. So after the board made uh, a decision and voted, all voted and agreed that Mr. Choi owes uh, a debt to Mr. Park, they had this second question should they take action or not? So I was like wondering why should a question be asked after finding out that and proving that there was a debt. So after that, they decided to take no action on the case when it was proven that there was a, a debt like more than a million dollars of uh, construction materials Would supplied to this contractor. Mr. Mr. O'Donnell, was there a reason why you decided to take no action on this specific case? Or the board, do you know? AG, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, the AG senator is, uh, if Mr. Park uh, offered that case, just tell him to go with us on the attorney general. So it's, uh, the uh, attorney general, they are the one who's handling that case, you know. But is there a reason why the, you, the, there was no action taken at that time? Well, uh, according to the board, the, the, because we are, uh, they said we are not a collector, we are not a court, so on that kind of amount of money should be, should be closed. That's what the board said. Okay. Okay, I, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just to make a statement, I, I've, I see that there's a big gap in your standard operating procedures and there's also a question of whether uh, you are, you're at the agency or the board is, is doing things with full integrity. And so I hope that you consider it uh, really cleaning house and maybe also re-examining your position as the executive director. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Senators. Uh, just a couple of uh, follow-on comments. First of all, Mr. Zavata, you had your hands up? Did you add, want to add a, a comment? I just, I would just like to add something to that, uh, the last uh, issue that we were discussing. Uh, I just can't believe that no action uh, is taken on that case because uh, we, we've been handling smaller cases such as uh, safety issue, workmanship issues, uh, 
different kinds of minor issues that uh, we give citation to uh, the contractor and they comply with the citation and we take action like put them, putting them on provisional license until they make payment for the, for the citation. But on this case, this contractor, there wasn't action taken on, on his license. He's been renewing from 2012 to 2017. And even the, the, the citation uh, at an amount of $25,000 hasn't been paid. Let me ask, thank you very much, Mr. Zabata. Uh, I guess this question would be posed to the chairwoman of the board. If there is a dispute, and I understand about if it's a civil dispute between one contractor versus another, but if there's a dispute in finances owed to another company or individual, is that a cause for further reviewing an application or not granting an application, in your opinion, as chairwoman of the board? We would honor if there's a dispute, whatever is decided from the court between the two parties is Do what Do you know that to. you're empowered by the law to revoke, if not grant, a license to a contractor that has outstanding obligations to another contractor within their field? Do you know that you're authorized by law to rescind and not, not approve a, an application? Correct, yes. We but have. your comment, your previous comment, the reason why I had to inject that statement is because your previous comment is that we would honor the, the court of law. Your responsibility is to protect the community. And if a contractor has an outstanding obligation, and it says specifically, the law says specifically, within their field of service. So if a contractor has a dispute or has an outstanding obligation, then it is your responsibility to use the investigative arm of the contractor's license board to validate that and either put additional restrictions or provisions on granting a license, not revoke it, revoking it automatically because we're not, we want to, as a government entity on behalf of our people, we want to foster business activity. We want to support the business community, but not at the expense of outstanding obligations that are not being met and then we're giving them the license to go conduct another uh, project and continue that entire scheme. So I had to, to interject in that. And, and Madam Chair, I would certainly encourage you to take a look at the powers and duties of the board because you, so, you have so much authority. If any of these cases are challenged in court and they bring the board in as to why you did not follow the law, then I have no idea what, what is going to come to your defense. Because all it would take is one contractor being given an opportunity to conduct business on Guam and knowing full well there are some other concerns and then bring harm to the community or to an individual or to a family member. Not, my, not just a family member out there in the community. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to mention that. And let me just read the powers and duties of the board. Grant licenses to contractors pursuant to this chapter. You're very familiar with that. Suspend or revoke any license for any cause prescribed by subsection 70116 or for any cause for suspension or revocation prescribed by the rules and regulations and refuse to grant any license for any cause which would be grounds for revocation or suspension of a license. There's other provision in here, but going, referring to section 70116, it highlights approximately in excess of 18 different items, 20 different <coughs> items to be exact. But let me just highlight a few. Board has the prerogative and the discretion and the authority by law to revoke licenses or to not grant licenses based on the following conditions. Any dishonest or fraudulent or deceitful act as a contractor with co which causes a substantial damage to another. Right there, finances, automatically becomes an issue at hand. 
another subsection of that. Misrepresentation of a material fact by an applicant in obtaining a license. There is a situation that was highlighted in the media and also discussed very briefly here, where a contractor in their application misrepresented financial information. A complaint was filed that there was a misrepresentation of financial information and that proof can be provided and that complaint was never entertained. And let me read that again. Misrepresentation of a material fact by an applicant in obtaining a license. Another item is willful failure to pay when due a debt incurred for services of materials rendered or purchased in connection with operations as a contractor when the individual has the ability to pay or when the individual has received sufficient funds therefore as payment for the particular operation for which the services or materials were rendered or purchased. Another sub item, the false denial of any debt due or the validity of a claim therefore with intent to secure for license, employer or other person any discount of such debt or with intent to hinder, delay or defraud the person to whom such debt is due. And then one final sub item category, no license shall be suspended for longer than two years and no person whose license is revoked shall, shall be eligible for a new license until the expiration of two years. That's why Chairperson Pizarro, these are very explicit in the law to protect the interests of the people of Guam. And you are tasked with the responsibility of carrying it out. Some of the situations that have been shared this morning tells me otherwise. If a complaint is filed, then Director Adonis, you need to entertain that complaint. 2009 to 2015, that's an extended time frame. 2016 to 2017, it's best to entertain the complaint, allow your investigation section to do their job, their due diligence, and make the recommendations to, to yourself as the director and to the board. That's all our people expect from us, is to serve as stewards and protect the interests of the community and protect the interests of the business themselves, the contractors. You're protecting the interests of the contractors by virtue of giving them the license, but they also have certain prerequisites and requirements and they have to meet those requirements. And to say that a financial obligation is not part and parcel of a reason to rescind or to not grant a renewal, the law says otherwise. So please revisit the law, Chairperson Pizarro. I have just a couple of other questions. The, uh, the contractor that was identified to not be a U.S. citizen and a complaint was filed, where are we with that complaint? Director Adonis? I'm sorry. Okay. Ms. Paris? Uh, I'll let uh, Maria first to, to talk about that because they are the on the administration uh, admin to receive some... Uh, but can you tell me exactly where it is now and then I'll, I'll ask for an explanation as to the process. Where is it now? With which one, Senator? With the complaint that a non-U.S. citizen was illegally given a license. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's a complaint on that that... Uh, when was the complaint filed? Uh, this is about... Uh, um, uh, almost two months now, something like that, a month or a month ago, something like that. Then it was uh, given a uh, a ID ID card. Correct. That, that's uh, like like is part of the corporation, something like that. So, and then there's a complaint that came in on our office, and uh, Mr. Sapanta at that time is off island. So I assigned that case to Miss Nida Bailey about that. I told her, 
work on that right away because that's uh, I think that's not good. It's not really good on our our uh, agency. So, Miss the investigator, Miss Bailey, it's worked not, on that. It's not that it's not really good on our record. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it is illegal. Illegal. Yeah. There's a difference. Okay, please continue. And then uh, Miss Nida Bailey worked right away to get back that uh, that card. You know. So. So and then we. we and then we, we took that, and then the guy who was have a uh, ID, he left the highland right away. So that's that that's the that's the case on that. So is the case closed? The individual is no longer authorized. No more, no more. It's gone already. Was it an official action of the board? Pardon me. Was that an official action of the board to rescind the license? Uh, you did the administrative part. You no, know, it was uh, it was reported to the board uh, uh, that 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 uh, incident, and then that's why the investigator worked very fast to get back that. that Director Adonis, you did what you needed to do. You rescinded the card. Now, was that an official action of the board? Chairperson Pizarro. Repeat your question, sir. Did the board act on that particular rescinding? I. Uh if it was an item on our agenda, we Chair, would make a decision. Chairperson I Pizarro, I specifically directed the question to you because the board is the only authorized authority to give a license, to give a renewal, and to rescind the license. In other words, he took the paper, he took the card back, but that contractor, so-called, still has the authority to transact action unless the board rescinds it officially. So please, it's either we close the loop or not be challenged so that we prevent any challenges in the future. That's why I'm recommending that you please revisit the law because the law is on your side, but you need to be able to carry it through. Director Adonis, I heard more than two different, three different situations this morning that they took action, but the only authority by law by law, is the board to rescind, to provide a renewal, or to approve an application. So every single application should go through the board. Director Adonis. I understand as the administrative arm, you're doing the bulk of the work on a daily basis, but it's the board that is authorized by law, not your position, not the admin officer, not the investigator, but the board is authorized by law to provide an app, to approve an application, rescind an application or a license, or to provide a renewal. The other, and I, I know I'm switching uh, gears here just for a moment, but I've heard some concerns and complaints about unlicensed, I don't want to say contractors because uh, do they fall into the category of contractors if they're unlicensed, but unlicensed contractors what is the contractors license board doing about addressing that director Adonis senator can I can I let the investigator was he was caught he is the one who caught that unlicensed contractor so that he can explain mr. please, Agon. please if you can invite you're gonna invite someone up yes uh, mr. Agon, yeah. Please identify yourself for the record and respond to the question. Buenas, Senators. Uh, my name is Vince Ogun. I'm a contractor's license investigator. Yeah, the question was, what is the contractor's license board doing about unlicensed contractors? Uh, hello? Oh, yeah. sorry, forgive me. Uh, the contractor's license board and the investigation side is when we receive the complaint of unlicensed contractors, we gather the facts and the... You don't have to sorry, I don't know. Okay. Apologize. What the contractor's license investigation division is doing right now is when we receive a complaint of unlicensed contractors, we go out there and we gather the facts. When we receive the complaint from the complainant, 
We gather the facts, we go to the residents, and everything, we prepare everything. And so far, what the CLB investigation unit and myself has done is we go to the, I uh, refer them to file a GPD report in the respective villages. I also, as the CLB, we go into the GPD's criminal investigation section. And so far right now, with the, we'd like to thank the GPD for networking with us because they have already apprehended one individual who's uh, been doing this for quite some time, sir. So we also inform those complainants to go to GPD as well as we do as our part, just for record. It so was currently so in the newspaper where an unlicensed contractor was apprehended by GPD through the filings of the consumers, the public out there, and as well as the filing of the CLB investigation division. So aside from that one, one particular incident and uh, Director Adonis and, and the board, I appreciate that particular response because if in fact there's an unlicensed contractor, that individual or that company has absolutely no business doing this, conducting business if in fact they're saying they're a contractor. Yes, now sir. let me ask you, do you have any other complaints or pending lists of unlicensed contractors that you're still investigating? I do have some and I referred it already to the GPD, other cases of unlicensed contractors. Uh, what I have been doing is when I go on the site investigation field, I go to each village mayors and through other agencies about distributing pamphlets as we are authorized by law to about hiring a licensed contractor. I do have that document over there if uh, one, Risha, can you get that document there about licensing? So we're out there doing to the public, the government agencies as well as the, as the, the mayor's office, and this is the documents that I've been passing out. So to duly inform the public, because uh, you know there are victims out there, and to duly inform the public what they should do. But do you have any pending, ongoing yes. investigations? Uh, yes, sir. But it's we're waiting for the rest of GPD to apprehend the individuals, and that's something out of our jurisdiction. Okay. How many? Out. How many pending? One, two, three. I have about two. And in another case, another individual was apprehended maybe many years ago. So okay, so just, just based on this conversation, this discussion, you know, uh, the Contractors License Board, I'm pleased with hearing that in fact there's an ongoing process of ensuring that if there's an, a contractor, or unlicensed contractor out there that has been identified, a complaint has been filed with the Contractors License Board, you conduct the investigation and the research and then you also include the arm of the Guam Police Department so yeah. that in fact they can, the two, of you, two entities can work together in addressing that. So to all of the businesses out there, the individuals who are unlicensed, this is your fair warning, that there's an arm within the Guam, Guam Contractors License Board that is tasked with that responsibility. And if a complaint is filed, then you can be assured that the proper investigation will be conducted and that the police department will be involved in the process. So I appreciate you sharing that because certainly we need to not only share the, the information with the, the community, but let our people understand that it always starts with a complaint that's filed. If there's no complaint filed, then the investigative arm of the Contractors License Board will not be able to go out and just arbitrarily uh, conduct an investigation when in fact there's no complaint filed. So I appreciate it, uh, Mr. Ogden, for your, your comments this morning. Senator, do you have any final questions? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, <clears throat> you know, there, there's, um, there's corporations out there, uh, companies out there that, you know, deal with the, the construction industry, providing products, uh, services, and I know um, they are attached to uh, RMEs to provide a specific service, if it was air con or home improvement or, uh, um, you know, electrical plumbing. Um, are you verifying or cross-checking with the published license or listing um, with these corporations that are providing, selling these products? And are they, when a consumer is purchasing the product, um, are they, are these corporations um, uh, dealing with a licensed contractor to install these these items or what? in regards to those that are uh, selling air conditioning systems and everything like that uh, we've been receiving tips the CLB investigation division has acted upon it and what we do is we issue out a citation after all the facts have been gathered and if there's laws being broken that's when the citation is issued 
And when they come in, not only the citation, but I also give them a contract, how to obtain a contractor's license. Most of those individuals that were unlicensed selling and installing the product now have become licensed. But there are still some out there. But to my knowledge, I believe there are some people that are hiring contracts to install it, some businesses in there. Right. Uh, Director Adonis, if I may recommend Dan, if, if you could look at a updating of uh, listing of incorporations or companies out there that are providing um, certain types of products, either within uh, the construction industry, or plumbing, or electrical, you know, the, the, whatever classification related that they have the they have specific RMEs that to or contractors to address installing these items because that's one of the uh, complaints or testimonies that came in that some uh, corporations out there may be providing products out there uh, to consumers that may not be uh, dealing with a licensed contractor or a licensed individual to put install these items so you know I, I know uh, there's in the past where when we're up, updating these listings, we verify these corporations. You know, some of them come in with all their RMEs and we know exactly what their services they're providing and what products they're servicing. Um, last question, Mr. Chair, with Mr. Zapanta, uh, or Madam Chair, uh, with, with the proceedings on the boards, uh, and I was looking at the website and, you know, their meetings. Um, Mr. Zapanta or Madam Chair, if you can answer this, is, is the investigation unit or the investigator handling the, uh, a specific case uh, allowed to present the facts and findings or is it the executive director or are they in the meetings to make recommendations to the board based on what uh, facts and findings they've come across regarding uh, certain contractors? So they have a case and they, you know, they're, they're, I mean, clearly they're unlicensed, you can make it very clear, but if workmanship or, or working with an unlicensed contractor, is the contractor's investigation unit presenting that to the board or is it Mr. Donis? Usually when a, a complaint comes in, I'm just gonna, may I describe how it should go? about when a complaint comes in? No, the, the question specifically oh. is, I know that the process, I mean, you know, I just want to know if it's still ongoing that when through any proceedings that uh, with the board that the investigator handling a specific case uh, presents the facts and findings to the board and makes uh, clearly uh, whatever statement that needs to be made so the board can make a decision. Okay, uh, in certain cases there regarding mine, um, I email the board members and as well as the director, all one time shot. So they duly know because we, as the investigator, we report to the board and then and Mr. Adonis is the executive director. So they are duly informed. And then we get network with the private secretary to bring it to uh, new business or agenda, then it goes to new business. So they are duly informed on cases there of what's going on. That's is, going for is hearings. Is the investigator supervisor present to present those case on behalf of the investigation unit? Your Honor, we uh, normally uh, present our cases before the board, and just like what uh, Investigator Agan uh, mentioned, that uh, we uh, send email or we give them hard copies for them to review, and then when the board meeting uh, time comes, we uh, present our our case, whatever cases that we have, and we make recommendations uh, based on the facts and findings of our cases and then the board will uh, vote uh, to uh, based on our recommendation. So going back to this case that you reported to the attorney general, you know, you, you, you cited multiple violations. Did, did you make a recommendation to the board? Yes, uh, actually I have this uh, document, may I? Uh,
Mr. Zabata, so just so that everyone is uh, aware of the documents that you provided us, can you highlight exactly what the documents are? You don't need to read them, just highlight them. Um, Your Honor, yesterday I sent the certified mail to uh, the respondent, uh, Vicente uh, Carmona, uh, regarding uh, the notice of hearing, which is our uh, standard uh, procedures, uh, at least 15 days before the board hearing, uh, which uh, the uh, the board chair and uh, executive director, uh, Mr. Ordonia, signed. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the recommendation uh, on the other uh, page of the document, uh, um, they, I mean, Mr. Ordonia, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, unfortunately, they uh, didn't sign the recommendation to uh, uh, revoke the license of uh, Vicente J. Carmona, which uh, the complainant, uh, Mr. Thomas Tanaka, is requesting to the board. The, the uh, findings you have here, Mr. Zapanta, is, is from the government that the contractor is using substandard materials for Typhoon Shelter. No, I think I gave you the, the wrong one. Which one? This one? This one? This one? Oh, okay. So, Mr. Zapanta, it's, it's stu still pending a, a hearing? Yes, sir. Can you please talk into the mic, sir? Still pending a hearing before the yes, board? Yes, uh, the hearing is going to be uh, held on uh, August 16th of the, uh, this month. And, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Morrison. And, and the documents he's making reference to are uh, Notice of hearing for James G. James G. Foundation to be scheduled on the 16th day of August 2017. And then the other one is Carmona uh, for the same date. Vicente Carmona also with a hearing date of the 16th of August 2017. So those are the documents that have been provided to us. Uh, just a couple of follow on questions. Uh, Mr. Ogun, I didn't get the number that you have for undocumented. Uh, unlicensed contractors, how many do you have pending, aside from the one that you closed? I apologize, Your Honor. I, I wasn't aware I was going to be called to discuss this subject. Do you have any number? I could perhaps at a later time provide you those documents. Please, please. At uh, your office of the, the ones that we have registered already within the complaints in our office. Okay. That's been filed with GPD. Okay. Uh, yes, Senator. Uh, Mr. Donis, are you able to at least provide uh, the committee of, uh, of an estimate of the amount of unlicensed contractors, the citation. Uh, do you know any, uh, do you have the amount? Does it, Mr. Zapanta, do you have any amount of how many unlicensed contractors have been cited and paid their fine? Um, right now, I don't have it on hand. I can submit it to your office uh, uh, later on. I don't have the exact uh, figure. If you can give us information for the last five years, Pardon, sir? If you can give us by year information that the senator is asking for the last five years. Yes, I okay. will. How many unlicensed contractors have been investigated and complaints have been yes. filed? Yes, Mr. Sargan. Yes, Senator. Um, the thing about it is, so far right now, I have three, but these individuals are not complying by law, and they may give a false address, so issuing them a citation 
may be challenging as we try to do it by certified mail or hand delivered and it's just a false area. So issuing them citation is challenging as well. So those, those are all complaints within this last year, mm -hmm. the last two years? For some that are unlicensed, sir. Some are not cooperating. Some complied and they just, once they meet, they just bail. They just leave and they don't want to see the face of the earth here on the side, the CLB. So what, they, kind of, what kind of support or reinforcement are you able to get from the board or from the director? I'm so sorry again. What kind of additional support do you, are you getting from the director and from the board so we that you can We have full support with them when it comes to unlicensed activity because we're doing it by certified mail as it says in law and adju administrative adjudication law and also going with uh, GPD as I informed Mr. Odonis that we're going to be filing on behalf of the CLB and these consumers out there. So we have full support from Mr. Odonis and the board members. But you have three pending complaints. So what's, yes. the, what's the aging timeline for the pending complaints? So far right now, I just have three this year, just by itself. And they've been forwarded to GPD. Of unlicensed contractors. So you've done yes, the initial investigation and then now you forward it to GPD? Yes, sir, that's correct. I will provide those documents for you. And some of the, one of the cases that was apprehended the, it was within a three year time frame because the statute of limitations for a government bomb is three, eight, three years, I believe. So can I get a definite uh, information on that? I will provide Director that to Director Ordonis. Mr. Ogun, please, I do need uh, information in regards to some on complaints that have been filed on unlicensed contractors. Yes, now, let me, let me ask you a follow on question. He identifies an unlicensed contractor, goes to GPD. Do you include the Attorney General's office? No, sir. You may want to involve them in the whole process. Thank you, sir. Okay. We're still waiting pending uh, assigned legal counsel to our office. Then no what place. happens after it goes to GPD? Um, I just want to let you know also, not only referring them to GPD, I also informed them to go to the Attorney General's office to file within the consumer division or wherever it may go to help them. That's why I informed the complaints to go to file on behalf on, on themselves. Okay, so in addition to getting a, a definite response in writing to the committee, please, on your outstanding complaints. My question now is taking, looking at the process, and we've been talking about the process this entire time. What happens after an individual or a company is identified as an unlicensed contractor? What, what happens in that case? What happens it in that case? It goes to GPD. Goes to GPD and after the arrest, I believe they are arrested, booked and confined, or booked and released, how that process is out of my area. But then recently this individual has been, uh, this year has been going to court and the judge, the court makes the judgment on that and then we go from there. And the reason why I'm asking what happens after this, because that's within the arms of the law enforcement now. What happens after this? Does it come back to the board? Does it come back to Director Adonis to recommend to the board that these individuals highlighted are gonna be red flagged and shall not receive any application or renewal of application or it be approved for anything within the authorized timeline of the law, which says two years. Yes, Mr. Your Honor, just recently uh, I, rec I presented to the board during a hearing on unlicensed activity that to seek our legal counsel to file an injunction on these individuals that are unlicensed because the states in law, we have the right to, to go and file an injunction on them, but we're pending legal counsel and it was said in the past uh, CLB meetings so you're, lo you're looking at having the con contracted license board file an injunction, but I'm taking it a little further yes, sir. in regards to the board. The board is the only authorized entity by law that can give or approve an application or renewal or rescind a license. So it is about red flagging these individuals or these companies so that they never, or at least within the authorized restriction by law, are not even considered. I, I see, I'm seeing nods, but I'm acknowledging that that's not even part of the process. It's a suggestion that really the board, there was a, a, it was highlighted a little earlier that there was a red flag list. Well, guess what? That red flag list should include all these unlicensed contractors and it should be a decision by the board because you're the, the board is the only ent entity that's authorized by law. But yes, Mrs. Zabata? 
uh, folks are going to wrap it up. Sir, I would just like to add on to your uh, topic that you're mentioning about the unlicensed. Uh, actually, I do the flag list. Uh, I separate the unlicensed from licen pending licensed uh, contractors with cases. So, so I, I have a separate list of uh, unlicensed uh, red flag on a yearly basis. So this example would be added to your list? Pardon, sir. So, so the, the example that was highlighted by Mr. Argon, that contra yeah, unlicensed contract will be, be added, added to your added list? To the, actually, when Mr. Argon or Investigator Argon uh, receives a complaint regarding uh, even uh, licensed or unlicensed contractor, he goes to the admin and uh, red flag it on our system. So just to make sure when Anybody that comes in under that name that's red flag on the system, they are uh, ordered to see the investigation section. So, Director Adonis and Chairwoman Pizarro, there is a process in place. I just heard from Mrs. Zapanta that these businesses, unlicensed contractors, are red flagged. So, I'm hearing, I'm not getting the assurance from the director and from the board that you acknowledge that this process is in place. Hey, can I say something? Go your, ahead. Uh, your Honor, it's just when the investigation finds these individuals, we give them that uh, form to obtain a contractor's license. So long as they're coming into complying with laws, we should not deny them if they're going to do it legally. You know? If Mr. Mr. Ogden, you're absolutely right. This is all about following the law. Yes, sir. And if an applicant comes in and provides all that necessary documents, meets all the requirements, goes through the investigation, is cleared, passes the examination, by all means. Yes, sir. That's what we are here discussing is the process. And based on what was just shared with us by Mr. Zavanta and the, the initial responses, it's like there's a disconnect here. Yes, sir. Because the loop of your investigation for unlicensed contractors is closed by virtue of Mr. Zabanta saying that there's a red flag list, that unlicensed contractor is automatically added to the red, red flag list. But I didn't get that assurance from the board or from Director Ordonis. So there's a disconnect here, and we need to fix this process quickly. Yeah. Folks, this, today is a, it was a discussion of the process and listening and understanding exactly what the timelines are for an application, for a complaint to be entertained, and for those cases to be closed, for the discovery on unlicensed contractors. This is all about the process and assuring any future applicants and any contractor out there that the process is working. Folks, this morning I've heard that there's a disconnect and we need to fix it quick. Because like I shared with you, and, and perhaps I'm gonna to have to rephrase this one more time, the law is on your side, but you have to follow the law. And we need to assure the public that this process is available for any future contractors and any existing contractors. And then you ask the question, why? Because we want to assure our people and the business community and any individual or company or business that seeks the services of a contractor that has a valid license, that this process is good and you have the assurance that these contractors would meet these minimum requirements based on the application and that there will be no shortcuts in the construction of their homes and no shortcuts in the construction of their buildings or their facilities. That's really where the heart and soul of this discussion is. And if there's some areas that need to be connected and fixed in regards to complaints, if a complaint is filed, respond it based on the timelines that you provided. Because the sooner you provide responses, the sooner you provide a decision, then at least the individual that filed the complaint and the contractor that the complaint is filed against would understand exactly where they stand upon the conclusion of that. So it all comes down to not only the process, but the integrity of the licenses that you issue. So this concludes our 
discussion on the oversight of the Guam Contractors License Board. I hope that you have a lot of things to take away from this discussion. And it really focuses on not only entertaining the complaints, but assuring the community that the, the license they receive is a valid license that they can be assured that these contractors are abiding by the requirements of the law. So other than that, I'm going to conclude this discussion. I want to thank everyone in the audience who have attended this, this morning's oversight. It's an oversight specifically to look at the process and make sure that it works for the entire island community. So I, I appreciate your responses. There are certain areas, uh, takeaways that I need, information that I have requested during the course of this discussion that I, I would like to request that it be provided to the chair so that I can disseminate it to the members within 15 days. Please, I, if not sooner, get me that information and then we can proceed with uh, ensuring and assuring the public of the entire process. Any individual in the audience who have filed complaints, uh, what I can do is, because it's an oversight hearing, the discussion with these individuals from the Contractors License Board has concluded. I'm going to ask you, Director Adonis and Chairwoman Pizarro, if you can remain with us. It would be providing information and then we will get you responses accordingly after you, you pose your, your question or your concern. Okay, so I'm going to dismiss the panel, and if there's anyone in the audience that would like to provide comments with regards to the process and our discussion today, I'm going to invite you up to the front. So, Director Adonis and, and the board members, if I can ask you to please remain for a short while longer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and proceed with the, uh, if I can ask you, uh, Director Adonis and the board members, if I can ask you to sit in the audience just momentarily so that we can entertain any statements from members of the community. And then we will invite you back up if, you, if uh, we can get direct responses today. Let me start from the uh, right of the table, please, if you can identify yourself for the record and provide your statement. My name is Joe Seacad. I'm with uh, HSG. I'm a director of the company. Tommy Tanaka with HSG president. We're, we're going to go with uh, your statements, okay? So if you have any statements, Joe, uh, Mr. Seacad, uh, to provide to the committee, and then we'll entertain you, and then we'll go down the list, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and also uh, Senator Morrison. We, uh, HSG filed a complaint uh, sometime in February. Uh, I think it's already been mentioned here, the details of that complaint. I just wanted to clarify that when the complaint was filed, there was no mistake about the issuance of a uh, license, be ID card being issued to a foreign national. It was our complaint that initiated that process and then it was discovered that a mistake existed. Now, that license was issued in January, and the IDs were issued in January. Uh, Mr. Tanaka uh, attempted to file a complaint to uh, essentially prevent the renewal in June. So they had all the way from January through June to address this matter. Uh, and again, uh, According to Mr. Zapanta, this matter still has not been resolved, and we're simply looking for, uh, I think everyone's mentioned it, we want fairness, we'd like the integrity of the board and the office to be upheld. Uh, we just want to do what's right. And so uh, we feel strongly that 
that uh, the applicant uh, on the, for the RME uh, submitted documentation that was clearly, as you pointed out, Senator, Mr. Chairman, was a uh, material misrepresentation of a fact. And so, uh, particularly as it relates to the financial statements. And uh, I also want to make it clear that in that particular financial statement, that individual stated, and there was a notation underneath, which I believe is required for all other statements, that under penalty of perjury, he has testified that the document that he was signing was in fact true and correct. When in fact the financial statement, the construction company that was noted on that statement did not exist, was not licensed, and if it had been a mistake, he also signed as the owner <laughs> of this construction company, which did not exist. And so uh, that was really a, the, our basis for contending that this individual did not have the proper integrity and the honesty and fair dealing that is a big part of the requirement of being a contractor. And so, uh, so subsequently we filed that complaint and we also filed the complaint uh, relating to the issuance of a um, ID to a non-US citizen. And it's, uh, it also goes to, we believe, because we believe that the, that RME applicant as well as that foreign national were together, and I believe there's documentation to that, that that RME also did not uh, deny, did not in any way indicate that this person uh, should not have gotten this ID, which for us further uh, supports our contention that this person lacks that integrity to be a contractor. So on the basis of we're protecting the public safety, we want to serve the people well, and obviously also we want to make sure that as contractors in this industry, we don't want other, you know, contractors that, or other individuals that are uh, not abiding by the rules and regulation, and particularly the law, uh, that they are participating in this, in this industry. And so we want to protect the industry as well. And so that's uh, really our statement. I, I don't know if Mr. Tanaka has anything else to add. Yeah, I mean, Joe covered uh, pretty much the basis of the complaint. The, the only other thing I wanted to add was, uh, was that uh, the response from the CLB was basically that uh, uh, they, they revoked the license and, and from, uh, from uh, the, the, the Japanese national. And then they also, uh, that the, the, the balance sheet and the personal bank statement of the individuals were the same and they felt that represented the, the right uh, finances and, and they closed it. They didn't, that, that process did not go to the board. They closed it individually upon, you know, upon that own in, uh, investigator. Uh, as as you, you stated here earlier, I mean, after the investigation is done, it should go to the board for for review and decision, it didn't. It didn't get that get to that process. They just uh, took it upon themselves to issue me a letter saying case closed. Mr. Taka and Mr. Seeket, uh, just a quick question: Is there a public discussion component of the board meetings? I believe there is. There is, and I've and I've been to the board meetings. Every board meeting they've had. Have since, you brought up this issue? And I've, every board meeting and during the public, the public discussion section, format. I just, I, I, in fact. Because nothing happened, I went in and I made a public plea to to the board, saying, "Hey, you guys closed this case. Uh, I don't believe you guys, you know, reviewed it enough." And uh, and I asked the board to take a look at it. And I've been back there three or four times, and up to now, uh, still no decision. The on, the, the last meeting, uh, investigator, investigators Aponta presented me with that uh, notice of revocation hearing, but he explained that the board did not want to sign it. They didn't want to issue it, and I've been following up, trying to get a copy of a signed uh, notice of hearing and revocation. Well, you, you, you're aware of the hearing dates now for yes. your complaints. Okay, that's so that, that I believe is, a is in the process that would ultimately address, hopefully address uh, your concern. Okay, so do we acknowledge that? Yes. Yeah. One and last comment, yes, sir. Yes. 
we also, just to, just for the public record and also uh, because there's been some reports in the media and also I believe there was a statement made by the CLB that, that the reason for this complaint was envy or jealousy. Uh, we want to make it absolutely clear that that is not the case, that that is absolutely uh, false and that the reason we are, we have filed the complaint because we believe that there's been a violation of the due process and a violation of the law and hence our complaint. And we have asked that as a consequence to that, that these licenses be revoked. I believe that that Thank hearing is, is scheduled already for August 16th, so for based on the complaints that you have filed, so we're going to continue to monitor the entire process and ensure that any future complaints go through a recognized process within a, a reasonable timeline. So, Mr. Seekat and Mr. Tanaka, thank you for sharing your perspectives this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Morris. Thank you. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Nelson, please identify yourself for the record and your statement. Today, Senator Morrison and Senator Hagen, um, we were we heard of the oversight meeting, and uh, I'm a complainant and a stakeholder, and I filed a number of complaints with the board. Uh, it's been uh, it hasn't been easy as a complainant and all that, but at, at my opinion, the time I filed my complaint, it was led by Mr. Zapanta as a lead investigator. And it was passed on to Miss Nita Bailey, which I felt that she did a sufficient and a good job. Uh, but I, I ran into roadblocks for one thing. At the time I filed my complaints last year, you know, it, there was internal uh, problems with the board. For one thing, the lack of legal counsel. You know, I can make reference to my case, I can bring my case here, but being it and seeing it, um, you know, the attacks being made, I wish Mr. Zabanta had used due diligence for my case and other complaints to bring it to an oversight hearing like today and, and only referencing to one case in the newspaper. I've even met the former chair before, Senator Tom Ada, myself and Mr. Tatalta, uh, expressing our concerns with what's going on. You know, for one thing, the lack of quorum, uh, the follow-up with the investigations and a lot, of, a lot of times we would be the ones supplying a lot of the information, a lot of facts and everything pertaining to the case. In my case, I felt they were due to the legal counsel problems that started in October of uh, 2016 when an attorney came in and made threats to the board. You, you asked the board to go ahead and they, you say, you work for the people, you, you, you have this behind you. But when you have attorneys my case, I will take care of my case, but seeing as a stakeholder, if you have attorneys, even when my case was being presented, before I was allowed to present my case, um, I guess Mr. Zapanta was off island. So I went, they informed me to go there. Nita Bailey was there, the other investigators were there. My case was presented to the board. A couple of lawyers came up right before the board meeting presenting their case, throwing papers out to the board themselves and making assertions, accusations, hey, all kinds of fraud and all that and all that. So that's a crippling effect for the board to render decisions on any cases, dating from the first event of October of last year. And you know, the board didn't even meet, or they be it the lack of quorum, or they didn't meet for so many months based on law they have to meet, or be disqualified. But for that reason and the lack of legal counsel rendering proper legal decisions to protect the board, it leaves them as individuals, like you mentioned earlier, Senator Ogden. You know, if it goes to court, they can be taken into court and all that. But if you have a decision even from without the proper legal counsel, how can the director, the investigators, or the board try to have the right opinion to go and make uh, the proper decision to protect them so they can protect us? You know, and that I see internally that's what happened briefly what happened to the board, and it's still ongoing. My case went out, this, this, this contractor was a habitual violator, admitted his uh, violations, and not only to me, but other complainants, and he admitted it, but yet they were, re, they were given back their license based on a decision because not even a week, 
The investigators provided the Attorney General's office without even reviewing it, gave it to another Attorney General that had it less than three or four days without consulting the director, the board, or investigators in, in, about the case and sitting down with them. How can an attorney come to a finding without talk, presenting the facts? You know? So that didn't occur, so they rendered that the board made the wrong decision and were issued the, reissued the license. And that's us as stakeholders and complainants that these people were in violation of law, and we feel because of them violating the law, they're habitual, and there should be something done. I don't know if there's provisions in this law, or Senator Morrison, Morrison, you were there before. If you can add in that if these habitual violators, I don't care if they should file Chapter 13 and they were habitual violators before, before they file bankruptcy, then they go back to the board, the contractors thing, and reapply, and it's the same individuals that violated law pass, or the same individuals are violating law now. Our, our, our properties are destroyed for life. And the board, because of the problem with the legal counsel or quorum, the chair had to leave. I went to meetings like Senator, uh, Senator Tanaka, Tom Tanaka, and I tried to get into the meetings, but it's hard for them to meet because of that one thing. You know, how can any institution or agency I wish they, there was due diligence with the last chair. When we went in to his office, we brought our, our thick file and then we talked to them expressing our concern for ourselves and other stakeholders and other complainants that own property in Guam. Because some these some kind of contractors go around the island, they make promises. Maybe we're fools for believing and trusting for financial loss, financial gain or development of our property. We get hurt. But we fell through the cracks. And up to this time, these guys are still operating. They have their license. The board hasn't even come. My case is still pending. They try to close my case. My, my case is of variable factors, from the destruction of property to supposedly contaminated soil put on my property that's being the, I have to go to EPA, talk directly to the Admiral's guys. And the thank to uh, Mr. Mark Calvo and Walter, young girl, they uh, allow me to come in and express my my concerns, and now it's work, working as it, you know. And that's why I asked Mr. Zavanta, how come you're not following up? He says he's following up, okay, until I see it in writing. I get tired of emailing and emailing. So Mr. But, you know, Mr. Mr. Nelson, where is your complaint at the moment? With them. And it's been there for how long? Uh, for a while, two years. Two years. Yeah, but well, they, I, I they did, the contractors board, the investigators, Use due diligence. They had the contractors move out all the debris, trash, oil drums, and all that, broken machinery and everything. They, they, and they also the, some form of uh, compensation that was owed to me, which they admitted. But they didn't, they didn't fulfill of destruction of my survey boundaries and all that, which they have to, as contractor, be abided by because they're at the project site. And also my concern about my so the soil being placed on my property. But I've been living, I've been living the contractors' board's life, just going in and calling, talking to administration and everything. And I, yeah, I see the internal struggles going on between everybody. But that's not my. There's nothing I can do about it. But the only thing I can say, I think you should make reference to the board, not saying cleaning up your act or they're weak. That, that wasn't brought up today. I was, I was surprised it wasn't brought up by the board chair which before it was uh, another board chair, what's his name? Who's the old board chair? The American guy. Yeah, a very respectful guy, Riley, but when you had the attorneys throwing papers in and making threats of suing your pants off, suing the board without any form of legal representation to back the board's findings or if they make decisions, a contractor, a crooked contractor can hire an attorney, go in there and use form of intimidation. And that's what I saw in two different occasions. And I'm here, just a simple guy with my complaint, and Kulana, do I bring in an attorney to intimidate these people that are trying to provide me as a complainant the right and wrong? So that's what I see in it. You know, so maybe that's where all the fallout and internal struggling and the infighting is going on. I think that can be worked out respectfully among them, not because one individual has to go to the news and parks and all that. We didn't, we didn't go and do that. You know, we went to 
the former chair, we sat with them. They promised us an oversight meeting, referencing our cases and many others. We never got it. I applaud you guys for having this oversight meeting. It's time to wake up and shake the can. But, you know, that's where I look at it. If my case is still pending, I wait every month so I can see if I'm put on the agenda with the board. I want these people, these have been violated based on the provisions of this, this is what I read. They can have their license rescinded, but the board, I don't know if they're capable of doing it or they're waiting, waiting to fund the attorney general for, to get the findings. So maybe that's the problem. If the, they can get support of the attorney general with their cases, but it has to be done in some kind of, that's their job made to do. So I don't know what to say or that's well, I where think I come you, from. I think Mr. Nelson, you bring up a, a very legitimate issue and any time that you're dealing with either the contractors or you're providing a service such as renewing and, and approving applications and rescinding and canceling licenses, certainly you always need the, the legal representation there. So I hope that the board members who are in the audience uh, listen to that very intently and understand that it's not a game of intimidation. They bring in their attorneys. You always have the discretion of suspending discussion until the next board meeting and ensure that the Office of the Attorney General has a legal attorney there representing the government of Guam and the interests. Because Mr. Nelson, it was alluded to a little earlier, the law protects the board in a lot of their decisions, but they have to make sure that they follow the, the process and allow due process to, to any of the contractors out there that have to go through uh, hearing or whatever the case may be. So yeah, I, I appreciate not. you sharing, sharing your concern and, and I'm sure the board members I, would, I have listened I would, to you. I was just concerned that because when we file as complainants, um, once we get the attorneys involved, then it goes to civil litig litigation. So until that time, civil uh, litigation occurs and the findings of the board to support the wrong done by the contractor, then I can go to court. But if I can't get a decision from the board, a proper decision, a proper finding from the legal counsel, then what's the purpose of going to civil lit litigation? Then, I, like you mentioned earlier, I have to take everybody to court. You know, that's just my concern. And that's what I've seen in the past two years. I even had a case dating back to two, 2010 where th this guy signed my contract. He said it was a contractor, a multi-million dollar contract, and he lied. So I said with the board, it went to the attorney general. Just last year, I got findings from the board. They didn't do nothing. Okay, you know? thank you very much, Mr. Nelson. I take it the uh, firefighter is with you. So we'll, we'll proceed to... Good morning, Senator. Um, you have a diff different case from... No, no, yeah. I have my own, but okay. uh, I just want to say first, my Please. name is Tom Tetalta, and uh, I hear, I'm here representing myself. I'm not representing the department. Uh, in fact, um, I had signed personal leave to, uh, to attend this. But... Um, just listening to the earlier discussions about uh, the board and how they're performing, I really think there is a disconnect there. Uh, I don't know if, they've, if the board members fully understand the authority that they have. Uh, maybe they glance through it, but I don't believe they fully understand what they can and cannot do. Uh, let me give you a, a case I'm in point. I'm sorry, Mr. Tetalta. Just so that we clarify for the record, you are on personal leave. Yes. Okay, okay. I just want to ensure that any testimony you provide is not representative of... Not representative of okay. the department that I work for. It is, I am here on my own accord. Okay. Um, so the board is, like you stated earlier, they have certain authorities, certain things that they can do. Uh, in my case, um, a license was revoked or slash suspended with the board's approval. Yet... To reinstate it requires board approval, but the director was able to reinstate it without board approval. That sort of confused me a little bit. So there's some inconsistency there where when I ask, why don't you guys, based on the investigation, this, the investigation was done. It was substantiated that it was, the facts were true. The board voted to suspend or revoke the license, yet after certain conditions were met, not all, but certain conditions were met. The board didn't approve to get the license reinstated. It was just the director who reinstated it. So that was a little bit confusing for me, uh, how you needed the board to revoke it, but you don't need the board to reinstate it. Actually, that's one of the reasons why uh, I read provisions of the law 
to the members of the board as well as to Director Adonis that the authority rests with the board. Ultimately, any approval, any rescinding of a license or any renewal of a license is empowered with the board, not with the director. And I, I hope that during the discussion this morning that that was made very, very clear because the director, based on legal language in the law, the authority rests with the board. So how does, how does Joe Public hold the fire to the board's feet when the board is acting, let's say, outside of their scope or not in accordance with their authority? How does, how does Joe Public handle that? Because the board is the board and they believe I mean, their, their, their voice is final. So uh, I don't, I'm not sure how to handle that, who to go to or what have you, but if there, I had cited the, in my appeal, I had cited the section of the board's rules and regs and say, you know, I, I just kind of bullet point it. And they still didn't, and I, they still didn't uh, act within their scope of authority, and I, I didn't understand that. Well, you have several options available to you. One is the, uh, obviously, the Office of the Attorney General, because they would have legal guidance and representation to bring it to their attention. And then the other option is what we are discussing today is to try to fix the process and, and ensure that our people can be assured that when a license is approved and provided by the Guam Contractors License Board, that these are legitimate contractors. You know, after today's discussion, I'm hoping that the board will see the light and make the corrections that needs to be made. Uh, I'm hoping that they'll go back and review their the scope of authority that they can operate within. Uh, but one thing I do want to ask, because uh, I tried to bring this up to the board, and I want to ask the legislature, maybe you can address this, is when the board doesn't meet, they're required to meet once every month. When they don't meet, Senator, in 2016, of the 12 months that they're supposed to meet, they met three times. Eight months they did not meet, for whatever reason, lack of quorum, lack of whatever. When Mr. Rajel left, lack of chairman, so when I asked them, I said, you, you guys got to make this up because you went five months without a meeting. Five months. There are complaints that need to be entertained, but lack of quorum, lack of this, lack of that. There's got to be a way where these guys have to make up those things, make up those meetings. They're required to meet on the, on the third Wednesday of every month. If they don't meet, they won't. They won't schedule until following month. Same thing happens. And then it just goes on and on and on. Five months later, there's still no meeting. There's got to be a way that you guys can change the law and say, look, if you don't meet on the eighth, on the third Wednesday of every month, you need to make it up for that month. And if it means holding a double session the following month or later that month, then so be it. But these guys, if they don't meet, they don't meet. Okay, we'll just wait till the next. No, I appreciate your, your suggestion. So, they you can't it change it. it. It seems that they can't change it. So I'm hoping you guys can change the law to allow well, them to do that. First of all, with the, with the clarification of the law, that there's only one entity, it's called the board, that has the authority to approve or to rescind or to renew. Now, the question is whether, in fact, these board members are going to be consistent in entertaining some of these applications. Because when it comes to confirmation, then please don't expect to come to this chairman and ask to be reconfirmed is if in the last two years you've only attended 10 meetings out of 24 meetings that was slated. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so I mean, this is where the confirmation process also has to be part of the evaluation process of these individuals being appointed. I respect whoever the governor, in this case, Governor Calvo appoints to the board, but I also expect that you serve in the interest of the people of Guam and support the process so that we don't have contractor applications waiting for five, six months unnecessarily because of quorum. If there's an issue with quorum, you made a commitment at the onset to take on this responsibility, then own it because it's public service to our people. You know, so I'm based on the discussion today, I'm hoping that with that better understanding that the process will flow a bit smoother in terms of ensuring that whoever the contractors and applications and renewals and decisions are done appropriately. So Mr. Tatauta, thank you very much for your comments this morning. Uh, Ma'am? That's, that's it.
Please, if you can identify yourself for the record, you can proceed. My name is Carol Martinez, and I'm with TechRight Builders. Good afternoon. My name is Carol Martinez. I am the president of TechRight Builders and have been involved in the construction industry in Guam for the past 20 years. We have successfully completed the construction of numerous buildings from the ground up, including most recently the new Okapela supermarket. TechRight Builders has always been in good standing, has never been cited for any reason by the Contractors License Board. Earlier this year, TechRight Builders management employee, the RME, suffered an untimely death. I notified the CLB immediately and was informed that I had a period of 30 days to secure the services of another RME in order to maintain and renew our license, but that I would be given an extension of the deadline for an additional 30 to 60 days because of the circumstances. I was grateful for the additional time because I needed to renew TechRight's license so that we could continue ongoing projects and retain our workers in what has become a very tight labor market. TechRight Builders has worked with a mechanical engineer, Mr. Chris Tassau, for many years. Mr. Tassau has experience in the construction industry here and have experienced with him. Although Mr. Tassau thought with his recommendations from several of Guam's leading architects and engineers, Mr. Eduardo Zapanta, an investigator for the CLB, told us that he would have to interview, interview Mr. Tassau to determine his eligibility to take the RME examination. Mr. Zapanta also required Mr. Tassau to provide a copy of his engineering diploma, although there is nothing in the application form for the RME ex examination and certification that would require any sort of diploma, let alone an engineering. Nonetheless, Mr. De Zapanta insisted that it would be necessary before he would even interview Mr. Sassau to determine whether he was eligible for the test. Something that has puzzled me and bothered me about this encounter is that Mr. Zapanta also refused to provide a copy of the RME examination study guide to Mr. Sassau until after the interview had been successfully completed. To be clear, I offered to pay $75 for the copy of the study guide, but Mr. Zapanta refused, which I will add that is not written here. I went up to one of the staff members, asked if it by law, can I purchase that study guide? And they said, yes, I can. A receipt was off, given to me. I went and I paid the treasurer of Guam and got that study guide. Over the course of two decades, I have been through the process of renewing tech rights license many times, but I have never before encountered this kind of resistance from the CLB staff. In the past, they have been very professional and helpful in the process, but this time, Mr. DePonte was very obstructive. Ultimately, despite assurance that TechRight would be granted a 60 to 90 day extension because of our sudden loss, Mr. Zapanta informed me that CLB board had denied our request for the extension. Mind you, I asked, went in and asked, was there ever a board meeting? There was never a board meeting. Mr. Zapanta went on to tell me that the board denied the extension on my license. Mr. Zapanta then told me that he would not renew our contractor's license because the 30-day limit had expired and suggested that we hire another RME. The point that I'm trying to make here this morning or this afternoon is that there is a problem with the CLB office. The problem has a name. It is Mr. Eduardo Zapanta. Mr. Zapanta has taken upon himself to control the licensing process from end to end and has taken the liberty to impose requirements upon applicants that are not neither addressed in the law nor in the CLB's regulations. I believe that in requiring a responsible management employee applicant to undergo and pass some sort of interview in order to be deemed eligible to take the RME test places Mr. Zapanta in a position 
of judge and jury in selecting Guam's RMEs. That inordinate level of power may be adversely affected by, their, by other participants in the construction industry as well. Under other circumstances and procedural controls, the pre-examination interview could be considered to be a legitimate, I'm sorry, to be a legitimate screening process, but is not legally sanctioned in, the Guam, in Guam today. Also, an applicant to take the test should be allowed to do so without having to meet such arbitrary extra legal requirements imposed by Mr. Zapata. Furthermore, any person, applicant or not, who is willing to be able to pay the $75 fee for a copy of the RME examination study guide, a public document, should be provided with a copy. It should not be uh, dependent upon the person requesting the study guide to have been passed some sort of interview by Mr. Zapanta. There must be some remedy to this unconsiderable abuse of power in our government. Members of the committee, this is my first time testifying in the legislature's hearing. I hope that my testimony will be helpful to you in your deliberations. However, if I have not been clear in any way, I will not try to answer, I will try to answer any questions that you might have regarding what I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Martinez. <clears throat> My name is John Martinez and uh, I'm, uh, Carol Martinez is my wife, and she's my boss, and I'm manager of Tech Right Builders. <clears throat> I'm here just in support of her, uh, uh, you know, testimony. But just a point here that, again, here we are. We've been in the construction business for 20 years. We continue to operate and follow the rules. We employ. Uh, uh, um, we have employees. Uh, I, I think we have. Um, we keep about 21 uh, um, uh, people employed, four of which is permanent uh, on a permanent payroll, and we have 17 through our associate contractors. Whereas we, you know, we are, you know, fairly consistent. But, but then again, my problem here is that here's a situation where we have our RME who's passed. So we go to the contractor's license board because of these circumstances, we, you know, we trust that maybe we can be assisted because, and given, you know, given a, uh, an extension so that we can be able to secure another RME. But we want, you know, I think the concept here of an RME is totally not quite understood. And I think that's the big problem here. And that's why if you look at that list, I mean, my goodness, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of contractors. Funeral parlors, shoe repair shop, supermarkets that are contractors because, they're, because they have an RME. You know, I mean, I think, and here we are now, okay, going in there. I mean, given this extremely difficult time and where one individual sits in front of my boss, and tells her that we're not, you're not, you're not really contractors, you know, you're, 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 you're just more painters They're looking at your file here. And, uh, and uh, uh, the, the painless market that you just constructed here, that's not from the ground up, that's just a small project. Well, I don't know, it's a $4 million project, I don't think that's too shabby. And not only that, but we've done all the other painless market except for one. We've constructed some of the very nice buildings here that you've complimented us on down in Agania and many others and so forth. But I think the point that we're trying to put on here is that where does, where does one man here decide that, you know, uh, I, I just don't understand this, that you ha before you can take a test, no matter where you've already presented documentation showing that you have, that, you know, that uh, uh, from, architects and engineers and so forth and that, record, that, that you know that you've worked with and, uh, and, 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 and then you, you have to follow certain conditions and, and it, 
I think the issue here, and we, the comment here is that, well, why don't we just, why don't you just get another RME? But why should we get another RME? We have somebody within our, within our uh, business here that, uh, you know, but you're gonna have to, you pay for another RME. But why should I wanna pay for another RME? We have one that's within our company that, we, that can take the test. Well, we're still waiting for his, uh, we're still waiting for his uh, uh, diploma that says he's a certified engineer. Uh, where does it say that you have to be a certified engineer for you to be a, he's an engineer, but he's not a certified engineer. But we feel he's certainly capable. And I think that we certainly merit that 30 to 60 days considering the situation that because of the un untimely passing of our RME. So this led to a situation here right now where just like that, because we don't want to use another RME and we want one of our own, here's a perfectly good business that will just be thrown on the wayside. We were out of business. Now, sorry to say, but our, you know, we were, you know, again, when we brought this up and filed a complaint with the, you know, with the, with the director, I guess he understood our situation and we were able to get what they call a provisional 90-day uh, license. But then in the meantime, there was just all these stumbling blocks here because Zapanta said this and Zapanta said that and we're not supposed to do this and there. And it just got, kind of get very, it, it became extremely complicated extremely complicated. So, um, well, we now have another problem. Our RME is in the Philippines and he has a heart attack, you know? So he's gonna be there for a considerable amount of time. We have two large projects that we have to forego here, okay? And simply because we can't, in, in all honesty, we don't know if we can, if we can, uh, if we can, uh, uh, get our contractor's license on or before September the 19th. Now, another thing here is that, you know, we're, we, we do work for one of the large insurance companies here. We're, we're the contractors here. And one of the biggest problems here is we've always, we've always seemed to be going, uh, you know, being called upon to finish off projects, to finish off projects that were not completed or not performed right by other contractors. You know, I must turn my back if he's still here. And there's Mr. Um, Guevara. At least twice a month on some of these projects, I have to go to him and inquire about this particular contractor that failed this project. And he would advise me, you know, that, uh, you know, for, for reasons why. And, and then this way, I you know, I, 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 I become cautious. But then again, that's one of our major problems here, and we all know it. We have a series of unqualified contractors out there, and why is that? And I think this is an opportune time for us to look into this now. And all of this is a result of, because they have an RME. If you look at that RME listing, if I might use a fictitious name, how does Gloria Farnsworth, a housewife, be an RME for an electrical contractor? I can give you that name, but not here. Well, it's very simple. Well, she can, she can, honestly, she can, uh, she can make a good fifty thousand dollars per annum. I would think just in charging a fee, so that somebody else that cannot pass a test or whatever can be a contractor, an electrical contractor. I'll give you one good example. The way we utilize our RME okay, is we make sure that he participates, which is what he's supposed to do. He's an employee, and we use him as our subcontractor as well. Our RME, just our RME, for example, you know, we have, we pay approximately, what, $100,000 a year is what our, is what we know, what we know, what is, is what we average in paying our RME. We don't want it, say another RME. We want somebody that was in our company that will watch, with it, that, 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 that'll be with us, and that's the purpose of an RME. Because I bet you there's contractors here that, whereas I'm quite sure that through recommendations of 
the COV of, a con of an available RME, they don't even know who their RME is. I know three right now that they don't even know who their RME is, but they're contractors. Anyway, I, I, I think this is just something that this, this is an opportune time where you might have to look into this and maybe it's time to really just kind of brush things up and you know clean up this department and maybe eliminate a lot of these uh, um, the situation that you know is um, but actually our, our intent here is that we do have a complaint against one individual and that is Mr. Zapantas and the reason for that is because of the way he handled our case without any consideration for you know um, uh, where one guy can decide that he's qualified and he's not qualified and so forth and you're out of business regardless of the situation with us just imagine that because of the untimely death of our RME. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Mr. Martinez, for your statement. Can Mr. I Nilga? just have one more thing to say? Yes, um, If anybody's going to say this is all hearsay or made up, I recorded the entire conversation. If either one of you would like to hear this behind closed doors, you are more than willing to because Mr. Zapanta has indicated that I have never, he never said anything. It's there. I was told that I was not going to be given that license because the board decided not to. There was never even a board meeting. He Thank took you, this Martins. upon himself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Leonga. This is a little out of, uh, I'm Ken Leon Guerrero with Guam Citizens for Public Accountability. And uh, this is a little out of my uh, normal appearances but the reason I'm here today is because a small general contractor who has been on, in business on this island for nearly 30 years asked me to make a statement on his behalf. And that is that the biggest threat to the contracting business, small business, small contractors on this island is unlicensed contractors. He loses 50% of the bids he delivers to unlicensed contractors. And one time he reported the unlicensed contractor and the, the apparently the uh, investigators or whoever they send out could never find them in the process of constructing the house. So he made a comment to the effect so that house just magically appeared on this lot with no, with no help or anything. At which point in time it was uh, relayed to him that if he keeps making unsubstantiated complaints like this, that his own license might come under review. And since then, he has not been able, or he has not brought another complaint before the contractor license board. But he says that 50% of the business he does get is uh, res resurrection re work or reconstruction work on projects that were done poorly done by unlicensed contractors. He said this community is a, the construction community is a small enough community on Guam that all the players know each other. If they don't know each other intimately, they know who each other is. So when he goes to a site where he has lost a job, sees people he has never seen before in the business or in any of the meetings or on any other job sites performing the job, reports him, nothing happens, and all he gets it every time the instructor or the investigator comes by, they couldn't find him. There was no one there. Um, it just it says that we have a lot of work to do if we're going to have our citizens trust the government, the instruments of the government, because unfortunately, and I checked, Angie's list doesn't cover Guam yet. Because right now there's no way, if I was going to um, build a house, th there's no way I could find out who's licensed, who's not licensed. I mean, I didn't even know where the contractor's license board is. You never hear anything about um, checking licenses or anything. I mean, the first I've heard is the investigators say we leave a brochure at the mayor's office. When you watch TV ads, in the mainland, any construction company, they always put their name on and there is a URL where you can go 
to verify whether or not a business is licensed to do business, because this is a big problem in the mainland as well, fly-by-night contractors. But here on Guam, it's not like these guys can, well, they can fly back to the Philippines, but they can't, you know, go across state lines and come back and forth. But one of the reasons why his business is so small is because he can't get enough business to keep a full-time uh, staff. So he subcontracts out to other small contractors, so they kind of band together when one of them gets a project because the unlicensed contractors are taking such a large chunk of the business. And so when I came here, it was my hope that there was going to be as much time devoted to the unlicensed. In fact, I thought the unlicensed contractor was going to be the primary issue. That's why I came. Um, I'm glad to see that you're addressing the procedural stuff because it gives me more insight into it, but I think there needs to be more weight, more focus addressed on how these unlicensed contractors are able to get such a large share of the residential construction, small building construction, renovation work, and even government infrastructure projects. That needs to be addressed. Thank you very much, Mr. Leon Garcelli. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Martinez and uh, Mr. Martinez for pointing out those, uh, some of those uh, items and the criteria that they may not follow. I know that very well. I'll definitely address that uh, with the contracts licensing board and, and look at that. Uh, obviously, uh, there, it really shouldn't be one person. Uh, I know that for a fact, and it should be definitely go to this individual to be uh, reviewed first an investigation and now pass it. The director that now puts it, you know, if any, there's any issue and concerns, and of course the board uh, should uh, be looked at and allow that individual applicant to, Patrick yourself, to go before the board and make, make that case uh, regarding your application. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up and I'll, I'll definitely uh, look into that with COB. Um, Mr. Lingro, thank you for bringing up the unlicensed contractor issue. And when I was there, we, we were really doing our best to crack down on folks. We actually uh, worked with uh, many of our counterparts in law enforcement to help us apprehend some individuals that were notorious for especially our, 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 our elderly that were taking advantage. And I know uh, through the help of the COB there, we were able to not only apprehend, but uh, convict someone and uh, revoked many other licenses. But still there is a problem. And uh, we recently changed the law. And I don't think it's scaring some of these unlicensed contractors that, that the COB uh, can cite uh, up to 50% of their, their uh, contract. So whatever the amount is, the COB has that authority to cite up to 50%. So we changed the law to take, you know, and, and, and provide restitution back to the, uh, to the homeowner or the consumer. And the other thing we did, I know the COB has a website that publishes their, their, uh, their contractor's license, but we took it another uh, step further that after the renewal period, the contractors, I mean, the licensing board has, is mandated and sh uh, shall publish the listings of contractors uh, uh, to, uh, to the media or through uh, the papers to ensure that um, the people of Guam are knowing that is the, the latest uh, published site or contractors listings and that it came in to renew. And that's why I brought it up. I know it's the first year they did it and we will we'll con continuously monitor that. But yes, we need to uh, ensure that contractors or unlicensed contractors, um, that's why I asked the case, what is the amount of fines coming in from unlicensed, unlicensed contractors? Because you know they, they could take up to 50% of the, the uh, cost of that project. So I look forward to that report to tell us, you know, you're saying up to 50%. You know, we, I would like to know if, if you know, the COB is really using that, that uh, you know, to the fullest, go after these guys and assess them these fines. But, uh, definitely, we will we'll definitely do more outreach uh, to ensure people are not aware, that, you know, even for myself, I mean, when I was up there, uh, I, I went and visit these contractors to ensure, even when I was building my home, to ensure that, uh, you know, I, I, I did do my due diligence, you know, that even though I was sitting up there that these contractors were above board and, you know, protecting the consumer. but. 
I want to assure you that we'll keep working with COB and wherever we need to put more teeth into the, uh, the law to ensure that these unlicensed contractors stop. And, and you know, I, I was very disappointed when, when I saw a lot of our elderly being targeted, especially they didn't know. And, and you know, we went after a few contractors and, and got them arrested. Well, and since you've got the board here, I would like to suggest that they start using uh, public service announcements or something and get the word out because there's a lot of opportunities they could get the word out that there is a directory, that there is a registry, there is a way an ordinary person can either pick up a phone or go online uh, to verify whether or not the person that they're talking to is licensed because that has severe financial repercussions to a homeowner who has an unlicensed contractor come in, do modifications and repair that end up damaging a structure because now the insurance isn't going to cover it because the work and repairs were done by an unlicensed, therefore the insurance companies can bail on that. There's, there's a lot of problems and it's within their power to let the public know that you, you know, you don't have to just take somebody's word for it. They're licensed. Have them prove it. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah, if I might just, uh, just, just, just Mr. Martinez, one, we're going to... One point. Uh, yes. If I might just add, um, Senator Morris, you were right, right from uh, when, you, when, you, when you first started, uh, and I, I think you were going to play a major role in upgrading the contractor's license boards, testing procedures, and so forth. And I think you didn't have, you didn't quite have the support at the time, and I think that was your problem. But don't remember, we proceeded to come up with, we hired engineers, which is the insurance companies, we hired engineers where we presented you industry rates so you can have a guideline. We, were, we presented you the updated and so forth, uh, 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 modifications so that we don't necessarily have to follow the California, which is, has to be modified, but does not apply to Guam. Uh, uh, questions that are in that license that should not be answered here because it doesn't apply. And if you make a mistake on that, then it's a, then 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 then, it's a, then we're folded. I think you're in the position now, Mr. Morrison, and through the support of the chairman here, that I think you might look at that. And this could be the opportune time to. It's time to really, I think, to upgrade the uh, contractor's license. It's a very vital department. Senator Ogden, thank you very much for allowing us this. Uh, this time. And then, can you monitor? Can you can you monitor our situation here? We're a real classic example here. We're, our license is only good till September the 19th, and I think with the support of the board now and this understanding, I think we might be able to continue on as a good contractor. And I need to say, the staff very helpful. It was just this one gentleman that I was between the um, wall and rock. He just. Me? No. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Martinez and uh, Mr. Leongoro, and to the board members as well as Mr. Adonis, thank you very much for your participation in today's hearing. This concludes the oversight hearing on the Guam Contractors License Board.